Very good. It's a bit more than 1 p.m. in Brazil. My name is Ricardo Bruns. I'm a business English trainer. And today, on behalf of the, of the Brass Tissot Business English Special Interest Group, we have the pleasure to have our very first event in a while. Last time the Brass Tissot BISSIG had its own event was in the very end of 2018. And thanks for two special uh, people I'm here to glad to. We are having the Brass Tissot Business English Special Interest Group back on track. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Natalia Guerrero and also Rob Howard for allowing uh, our team to assume this uh, special interest group we love so much. And of course, we are here to say thank you very much for coming for this fantastic afternoon discussing business English teaching practices. It's going to be a four hour event, so make sure you have some water, snacks around you. Uh, there will be a 10 minute break. So allow me to briefly present what's going to be uh, our uh, schedule for today. Uh, we are here. Very good. I can share my screen with you so we can have an uh, idea about what it's going to be our event uh, today. Very good. Hopefully you can see my screen. Very good. So the today's topic is going to be connecting and supporting the business English teaching community in Brazil. Uh, and the, the idea is to have this very first encounter and connect business English teaching professionals from all stages and different uh, moments of uh, their own careers. That means if you are a person considering start teaching business English, then you are absolutely welcome. And of course, if you are an experienced professional as well, this is a place to enjoy and have a moment for uh, discussing uh, about this very interesting uh, topic. Good. So this is ours going to be our schedule for today. Uh, we are going to have, first of all, uh, our very special guest, Evan Frendel, which is an honor to have him here with us today, talking about the world of business English. It's going to be a 45 minute talk and we have a, going to have an amazing uh, Q&A session. So make sure you pay close attention to the content and bring your questions to the end of this fantastic talk. Later, we're going to have Karin Hoyt Galvão uh, presenting us what it what does it take to be a business English te teacher. So, what's necessary to jump into this uh, fantastic teaching field, starting at around uh, two p.m. Then we go for a ten-minute break, and then we're going to have Eliana Kobayashi speaking about English language testing in business context. What does it mean? It has a lot to do with how companies and how assessment of business co English communication skills occur and how is this uh, conducted in a business uh, setting. Then later, last but not least, we are going to have our business English special interest group uh, board members to talk to you. We're going to present ourselves. You're going to have the pleasure to know who we are and what we are here for, because we are going to talk about our purpose and our mission as a basic for our Brazilian teaching community. Okay, good. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to move forward because now we're going to have Evan Frando presenting us the word of business English. Uh, briefly presenting, of course, Evan Frando. Uh, Evan Frando is a British freelance trainer teacher, trainer, and author based in Berlin, Germany. He has been active in business English and English for specific purposes since 1993, uh, mostly in corporate sector. A keen supporter of teacher associations, he has been chair of his local association in Berlin, 
as well as coordinator of the IOTEFL BSIG, an international community of business English teachers you must know as well. Uh, good. Uh, in addition to that, Evan is a frequent speaker at conferences and before COVID, of course, he used to travel regularly to uh, in Europe and in Asia to Asia to run courses or to work as a consultant. He has authored or co-authored around 30 books. Uh, the most recent uh, of which is the six uh, principles of, for exemplary teaching of English uh, learners. So academic and other specific purposes in this year. Uh, and you may also know Evan Friendo for this other very popular book. So if you are willing to start teaching business English or if you are an experienced business English teacher, you must consider having this book uh, in your bookshelf. So how to teach business English has been by far one of the most uh, bestseller uh, for teachers uh, into business English uh, practice. Okay, so now I will leave the screen so Evan can speak. One second, please. Very good. Evan, can you hear us? Let me to, you can please unmute your microphone. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, Great. Evan. Thanks Great. a lot for coming. The screen is yeah. yours. I think I'm going to hire you as my marketing agent, Ricardo. That was a very nice <laughs> introduction. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for, for joining us. This is a auspicious day. Braz Tisol Bisic is, is getting up and running again. And uh, I think uh, today's event looks really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to staying for the next few hours and having some very interesting discussions with uh, people um, wherever they come from. They may be from Brazil, but I suspect there'll be a few people from outside Brazil as well. Um, my topic today is the world of business English. So it's really um, um, a, a glance through some of the different perspectives that go in to make up this word business English. And of course, we all know there are many, many different ways of thinking about business English. And in fact, you can see from my slide that it's actually quite a, a boring uh, title page. And I really tried hard to find a picture uh, to go with my opening page. And I thought, okay, so is business English something like a classroom with a teacher teaching and students and learners with their course books or their other resources learning? Is that business English? Um, or would it be better if I showed business English in terms of um, a building, a company, uh, you know, a company like this, there are millions of them all around the world, full of people who need to learn business English, they go through gates exactly like this. I'm sure everybody in the audience has enjoyed the pleasure of going through these gates with a rucksack on their back. Um, or is it about the interactions that business people do or people in business do? Is it that this is a meeting with presentation? Very, very common. Um, some people think meetings is the most common type of interaction in business English. So perhaps this represents um, business English quite well. Or is it this? Business English is about doing business. It's about doing trade. It's about the transfer of goods, commerce from place to place all around the world. Um, these ships are moving. There's 100,000 of them every day moving around the oceans. Um, by or transferring goods which have been bought and sold. That's all business, using business English. Or is it the business people who have come together and succeeded in some sort of project? Uh, here you can see this is a team of people. They spent a year, uh, I was involved in this, but here I'm taking the photo, but they spent a year um, from all over the Pacific area trying to put this uh, um, project together. And this was the final day when everybody um, but going and there's the cake they're eating. Um, so is it about business success? Or is it about the problems maybe we have in business communication, miscommunication, um, times when people interact with each other and they either misunderstand each other or they don't have the language skills um, to communicate uh, their message clearly. Um, it's a very different perspective of business English to the previous one, which is about successful business communication. 
or is business English about the technical jargon, the technical English that appears in every single type of industry, type of profession, type of business. And I know uh, everybody here is aware that if you go into a company, you're no longer doing a general business English course, but you're suddenly having to learn all sorts of new terms, new terminology, new phraseology, which helps you communicate in that specific context. So is that business English? Or, I'm nearly finished with this list, is <laughs> business English um, about research. All over the world, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of people doing their master's degrees, their bachelor's degrees, their PhDs, um, other qualifications, other research projects, all trying to understand the sort of language how uh, that happens in, in, in business communication, how it works, how it doesn't work, um, where are the issues, and they come in from all sorts of different perspectives and all sorts of different um, um, contexts, and that's something we'll look at in the next uh, few minutes. Or is business English about the future, about using technology? Uh, I'm sure we're all aware of these apps. This is an app I saw when I was in Japan last year. Um, you know, and it says work in fluent Japanese. You do not need to uh, learn Japanese. And the, the same sorts of apps exist for people who want to use English all over the world. Are teachers still going to have a job? Um, is there going to be a need to teach uh, English in the future? Is there going to be a need to teach as many people as we're teaching now? Maybe the numbers will become less. Maybe our jobs will change as we, we, we focus on other different types of uh, skills and, and less on the nuts and bolts of the language. Don't know. Or is it business English about trying to help people work across cultures, intercultural communication? This is a map. You can see right in the center is South Korea. And this is the map from their perspective, the global world. And you can see it might be quite a different perspective to the one you're used to. Uh, it's certainly very different to the one I'm used to where Great Britain is right in the middle and um, everything else is around Britain. But in this one, Britain is a very small island and you can hardly see it on the right-hand side. So um, different cultural perspectives, very, very important in business English. So maybe this is the best picture. I have no idea which is the best picture. Maybe they're all the best picture. Uh, I'm sure if we had time, I could ask everybody here to send in another photo and we would have dozens and dozens of uh, different perspectives of business English across the world. Um, what is sure is that business English is a, um, a difficult thing to pin down. It means so many different things to different people. So let's let's start with this question of what is business English. Let's try and pin it down. And this question has been discussed, of course, for years and years and years. When I first started business English in the 90s, this was a very, very influential article. I'm sure some of you have come across it. Business is booming business English in the 1990s. Uh, this was a, a basic member, in fact. Um, and she made a couple of very, very useful points, I think, which are still relevant today. First of all, we can look at business English as an umbrella term. In other words, it covers many, many different things. Now, she's talking here about general business purposes, so very general business English, the sort of English you might find in uh, publishers' books, um, and English for specific business purposes, which is the sort of thing you might have to develop your own materials and develop your own courses and, and work with specific clients. She also pointed out that uh, business English is interdisciplinary and it looks at language, it looks at interpersonal communication skills, it looks at business know-how, it looks at culture. You can't separate all these things from business English. And time and time again, I come across people, even in recent conferences, who, who come up and say, well, actually, why don't we think about business English in terms of communication? We have been thinking about business English in terms of many different perspectives. It is interdisciplinary and always has been. Uh, the problem is we all live in our own little bubbles and we, we, we get influenced by what context we're working in. And we forget perhaps that there is a lot of business English which we might not be um, have ready access to, as it were. And then one of the quotes from this article, which is, you, you might have seen this, it's been cited in many, many articles and books since, since this article was written. Business English is a materials-led movement rather than a research-led movement. And what she's saying here 
um, and what she um, identified was the point that uh, a lot of business English, which is taught in classrooms, comes via the textbook um, and comes from the teacher. And it's very often based on the teacher's intuition, the writer's intuition of what's happening in business rather than proper research, a proper needs analysis. And I know from speaking to colleagues all over the world that one of the big problems in business English is this, um, this lack of ability to be able to spend good time and, and good um, um, resources uh, in order to really analyze a um, particular department, a particular group of students, uh, and so on. It's, we don't really do very much business English based on solid research. We do it on a lot of intuition. We, of course, our research bank has been building up and this argument is still going on. Has this changed in the last few years? I think it probably has changed since the 90s, but I still think that the, the publishers with their huge marketing ability and their big push to sell books, which they identify as being able to be used in university settings, in language schools, in corporate settings, they in some ways really set the agenda of how teachers around the world view the nuts and bolts of business English. This is something we can discuss, of course. Um, here's another definition, which I rather like. Uh, business discourse. Here we're talking about discourse rather than English, but it's a similar meaning here. Um, and it's all about how people communicate, talk or writing in commercial organizations. Okay, I think we're, we're all agreed with that. But the key word here is, or the key phrase here is, in order to get their work done. And now this becomes a very different thing to any other sort of English where you perhaps are focusing on the language, you're focusing on learning the language, you're focusing on learning things about the language. In business English, the aim is not to learn English. The aim is to get your job done. Um, and if we see it that way, then the way we approach what we do in the classroom, when we say what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done, how we do error correction, how we make our priorities on the courses change completely. If we're really focused on helping people become more effective in their workplace, becoming more efficient in their workplace, doing their job rather than learning English in order to pass a test, in order to, uh, to meet some other um, um, outside um, reason for learning English. And of course, if you look at some of the literature, there are many, many, many books on, on business English. Um, this is one which I rather like, it came out a couple of years ago, Catherine Nickerson and Brigitte Planken, um, introducing business English. And you can see on the list there, the sorts of things, uh, the sorts of topics that they think it comes into a discussion of trying to understand what business English is. So it's something which we're not going to discuss and, and find a conclusion in 45 minutes. There's no way. There's a lot to it. Um, one of the key words here you can see in chapter two is international. The idea that business English is international. It's not really English as a foreign language, but English as an international language, which puts another different bias on, on how we think about the language. Uh, we often split it into spoken language and written language. Um, we always have to link it into the business world. And of course, we're looking at different perspectives when we're teaching business English. Here they're talking about learners, teachers and materials, which are probably three main elements. There are many, many teaching approaches and these things change all the time. Things come in fashion, out of fashion, as research develops or as our understanding changes or as um, different contexts have different priorities on how they approach it. Here's another one. Um, an introduction to teaching business discourse. This came out last year, well worth reading. Um, and here you can see that the, the, um, the emphasis is slightly different. If you look at part two, for example, we're talking about research and client-based projects. We're talking about consultancy. We're talking about writing materials. So here we're, we're stepping one, this is not an introduction to business English, but this is full of really good meat and discussion about where we are with business English. Um, so I recommend those books if you have time. If you look at a book which is researching the language as opposed to talking about teaching of business English, then books like this, this came out last year, Darius and Kohler, um, and you can see the different perspectives. We've got corporate perspectives, we've got management perspectives, we've got employee perspectives. And if you go through this list, you'll see that um, a lot of these things we never do in a classroom. I mean, branding is a very, very specialist area of business communication. 
very, very few business English teachers will ever touch branding in a serious way, unless they happen to be working with that department in a company. Um, we might touch it as a general topic in a general business English course, but we're not doing the specifics. Change management, managing conflicts, inclusion, all these issues. These are big issues in companies, big issues in, in corporations around the world. Um, and some of these topics are touched by us as, as business English teachers. Um, perhaps interviews, for example, or the language of recruitment is quite common because we're often helping people get jobs. Um, so again, it all depends on, on context and what our learners need. But basically, I think we're all in agreement nowadays that there are different contexts for business English and these different contexts, while they call themselves business English, and they're all absolutely convinced that they're business English, they share some characteristics, but they have some very different characteristics as well. And one way to think about the three main contexts for business English, I think, is tertiary education or university level education. Uh, so people doing a bachelor's or a master's degree or a PhD, perhaps in, in something related to business English. We're talking about adult education, which is typically language schools, um, which don't tend for business English to focus on, um, on young learners, although more and more, of course, uh, certainly in Europe, um, people at school, learners at school at age 14, 15, 16, are now doing business English courses before they even get to tertiary level. And of course, there's corporate training, and that covers a whole range, a multitude of different contexts and um, from very, very specific stuff to very general stuff. I've got three short interviews, one, two, three minutes each one, of three teachers, business English teachers, working in different parts of the world. Um, and I'd like to just play them and, and you can listen and, and compare what they say about their, their lives, their teaching um, day. Uh, compare it to your own teaching day and see how much you have in common and how much perhaps you you don't have. The first one is uh, Marinda from uh, from Beijing. Well, hello. I'm Jia Ying. Jia is my family name. Ying is my given name. You can also call me Marinda. I think it will be easier for you. I work in the foreign language department in Beijing Wuzi University. And I teach different courses. They are business English, intercultural communication, and college English. Business English is only for English major students. And the intercultural communication and the college English, the two courses, are only for the non-English major students. Most of my learners are the young students whose ages range from 17 to 21. Now let me describe a recent day to you. Well, I normally get up very early in the morning, actually on the Monday and Wednesday morning, because I only have to work the two days one week. But you know, considering the terrible traffic in Beijing, so I have to get up very early. Well, my first class this week was online. So first I had to answer a couple of questions from my students who needed help with business, business letters. And today I will have two important things to do. The first is I need to have an appointment with my one of my students to discuss her graduation paper. The second thing I need to do is in the afternoon, I have to give students a lecture. In the lecture, maybe I will let students to do their present, uh, presentations to tell me their answers of the cases I arranged them to finish last week. Well, this is my typical day. Hope it will be helpful. Thanks for your listening. And I don't know if uh, anybody here Bye. in the audience has ever worked in China, but China is a really interesting place for business English at the moment. It's a place where I think most of the business English is happening in universities. Um, of course, companies still have people inside in-house 
who are helping with translation and so on. But most of it officially is done in universities. But they are one of the only countries, I, I, I'm not aware of any other country, which have, now has bachelors and masters in something called business English, which is uh, a whole degree where you focus on the language of business English, business practices, um, uh, uh, international business practices across the world. Um, and you come out with something called a degree in business English. Now, she wasn't talking about that. In her university, she's talking about college English, which is for people studying something else and they have to do English as part of their course. So maybe they're doing finance or engineering or something like that, and they have some business English on the side, or they have what they call English majors, which are people who are focusing on a, lang a, a, a language degree. But as I say, in other parts of China, there are now these um, uh, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and leading on to PhDs in business English. And what's interesting is that a lot of the top research now coming out in the world of international business English, international communication, is coming from China, because they have all these students, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students, and they do things in numbers in China, in large numbers, um, and they're all researching business English. Many of these students work in companies, work in organizations which do international trade and so on, and they are researching these contexts in order to pass their degrees. This is something which we don't get anywhere else in the world. So they're not training to become teachers, they're training to become business English specialists, and that is something we do in China. So that's quite interesting, I think. Um, the next person comes from uh, Belarus. Belarus has been in the news a lot recently. Uh, she's in a language school in Minsk. Um, listen to what she says. My name is Natasha Dublevska and uh, I work as a business English teacher at Streamline Language School in Belarus. I'm a certified business English teacher as I have already passed FTB and back higher exams. I normally teach uh, business English in corporate groups. Uh, for example, this year I've been working with uh, corporate groups and individual students that come from completely different backgrounds, such as banking, medical, reinsurance, and agricultural spheres. But let me tell you a couple of words about my daily routine. As normally I have classes in the daytime and in the evening, I normally get ready for the classes either early in the morning or later in the evening. So, for example, yesterday in the evening, I had to check the invitation emails from my students that they sent to uh, their partner who is going to visit their company uh, for two days. Uh, one of my other groups uh, is working on their uh, presentations, uh, which they uh, will have to give at the end of the course. So um, we've agreed with them that they're going to send me uh, their uh, parts of presentations uh, for the uh, better analysis, uh, so that we uh, can be sure that these presentations uh, won't have any uh, grammar mistakes and uh, they will be uh, well and clearly structured. So this week uh, I'm receiving uh, their introductions and at the weekend I'm going to analyze uh, all of them so as uh, to provide my students with the feedback where they will see their strong points and the points that uh, can be improved for their final versions. Uh, today I also have a class uh, in Business English with my individual student where we're going to discuss decision making. So as a result, now uh, I'll have to uh, dive deep into uh, this topic in order to analyze different uh, strategies of decision making uh, and to be ready to discuss them with my student. But to cut the long story short, I'd like to say that uh, my days are never the same uh, because uh, the tasks and activities that we are doing with my uh, business English students are completely different. But this is uh, the thing that is really uh, rewarding for me. Uh, and uh, I really love... Uh, so you can see here English. we have quite a different context to university. Um, we saw Mirinda before going in and teaching her students a couple of times a week. Um, and in China, they'll have big classes typically, um, and they'll have a set syllabus exactly like any university in the world. Here, Natasha is having to react from week to week, from day to day, from her, for her students who come from all over uh, the business world and who might come in and share a class together. So they might be different people from different companies sharing a class. They might be different professions sharing a class. Um, 
and she's having to react and deal with specific problems as well as come up with some sort of syllabus, some sort of teaching plan which meets everybody's needs. So that's very, very typical for language schools, I think, all over the world. Very challenging situation, but also quite common, I think. Um, the third lady uh, is Oksana from um, Ukraine. You might, some of you may know her. She's very active in, in the BSIC uh, committee, in my ITEFL BSIC, that is. Um, and Oksana does more corporate training. So she's not a language school and she's not based in university. So she has a, a little bit different slant on, on the job of a business English teacher. Hello everyone, my name is Oksana Hera. I'm a freelance business English trainer. I'm from Lviv in Ukraine and I mostly work with IT professionals in our area. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are only tech people like software developers or quality assurance engineers. They are very often accountants or HR managers, recruiters or um, project managers too. And one thing that unites uh, them is that they are all very busy. So they don't have any extra time to travel anywhere for uh, any type of training. So they often prefer online mode. That's why most of my training is online nowadays. So for example, on Monday, I'm going to have four online uh, classes two in the morning and then two more in the evening. Um, my first class starts at 8 a.m. So I have to wake up at about 6.45. Um, and the first thing um, I do is I check my emails. I set up the Zoom room and um, I sent out the invitations for people to join these sessions. Then after these classes are over, I have to prepare for the next um, um, part of my working day. During those hours, I also actively uh, communicate with my clients um, through messengers, mostly Facebook Messenger or Skype, because if they have any question during their working day, uh, they really appreciate if they can text me and ask um, for help. So these um, answers from me have to be quite um, quick um, and up to the point for sure. Um, in the evening, um, the two classes that I, uh, I'm going to have are very late classes and it's not really my uh, choice to have them, but um, I have to accommodate my uh, clients' preferences. Um, and then the, the hard thing is that when I have morning classes on Tuesday again, this is a very short break between classes um, on Monday evening and on Tuesday morning. Um, there are some clients who do prefer face-to-face -face tra training. So um, let's say on Thursday I have a 60-minute class for which I have to travel um, um, myself. And um, it's, it's about um, uh, twice as much. Um, I mean, that's about one hour one way and an hour back. But this is a very interesting client and I um, feel that I'm gaining a lot of experience um, too from working face to face and being on site in that company. Um, so, um, depending on what clients uh, need and uh, uh, what kind of um, time slots they have free, I mostly arrange um, the training um, this way. And um, you, I Oksana. wonder how that happens. So, with... you can see here again, this context is actually shares a lot, of course, with the other two we've just seen, but also there are some critical differences. The first thing which she didn't really talk about very much is the fact that she's freelance, which means unlike the other teachers who probably have a fixed job or a steady job or they know where they're going to be next week, somebody else is doing the marketing, finding the clients, probably doing half of the needs analysis. If you're a freelance working alone, you're probably doing a lot more yourself. And in this case, she's working directly with IT professionals. So it's all in one industry. 
maybe different companies, but she's specialized in one specific industry and she's obviously having to find her own clients and, and work with them, which means that she has to be able to react very fast because they don't see her only as a teacher, but they see her as somebody who is available for help at any time of the day and night. And she made that very clear that she often gets uh, text messages and so on, and people expect um, a quick reply because things are urgent, uh, people don't have time, and she's the, the checker of last resort, as it were. Um, it's interesting that she doesn't only do it online, she also goes face to face, um, which is okay. This was recorded just before COVID, but there are still plenty of people around the world learning face to face because there are, of course, advantages. But in this case, her main job, even long before COVID, was online teaching with a little bit of face to face. So, one of the common things I think which really sticks out for me is that business English is not about native speaker English. And I've been teaching in many, many countries, doing teacher training in many, many countries. From my perspective, the vast majority of people who are teaching business English around the world are not native speakers. Whatever we call, whatever, however we define native speakers, most business English teachers are not native speakers. Uh, I suspect most of them are female rather than male, but that's just a factor of our profession. Um, and there are lots of different perspectives in business English. If you think about it from the learner's perspective, um, maybe they're wondering if their English course, their English training is going to help them do their job better. Would they do it otherwise uh, if they didn't need to do it? Um, the teacher probably has a different perspective. If you're anything like me, you're probably thinking, hmm, okay, I've done a lot of work creating this role play, creating this exercise. I hope I can adapt it and use it next time. I don't really want to have to spend time doing it again. So can I write role plays and simulations, etc., which I can move from, from context to context and, and make them appear to be more needs related. The publisher, of course, if you're using uh, published books, are really interested in selling books. That's their main aim. They need to sell books in order to succeed. Um, and so they will try and produce books um, which sell to as many people as possible. Uh, we've had phases over the last 20, 30 years where publishers went for ESP type books, very specific, but most big publishers have stopped doing this now because there just isn't enough money in it. Um, and in fact, even companies, uh, big, big publishers who have gone for university context have decided to try and sell their books to university and uh, say corporate context. They're trying to get the numbers in all over the world. This means that some course books can be quite bland because they have to meet the needs and expectations of people all over the world. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge debate in our industry, uh, what the publishers do and the influence they have. But of course, without publishers, without course books, and I've written many course books myself, a lot of teachers just wouldn't be able to get off the ground. So they're fantastic resources, depending on the context. I'm not against course books, but they have their, their pros and cons for sure. Um, the client. The client can be the person perhaps who's paying for the course, if it's in a language school or in a company, or even if it's in a university. So they want to know if the training is actually adding value to the company. They don't, they don't care if people learn English or don't learn English. They want to know that if my employee learns English, is it going to bring me value? So that's another different perspective. If you work in a testing organization, and testing is a bit like publishing, it's a huge mega influence on teaching English as a foreign language and teaching business English, then what they're interested in doing is, is covering things which can be tested. Um, and not all language is easy, um, can easily be assessed, can easily be measured as it were. And so that tends to bias a lot of what we do in business English training towards passing an exam. And uh, for example, Japan is famous for producing thousands of people every year who can do very, very well in the TOEIC test, which is probably the largest business English test in the world, but who have no speaking skills because you can get through it and get a good grade without actually having to speak. So um, testing like publishers can have a huge influence. They're motivating, they're fantastic resources, but they can have a huge influence on what's happening in business English. As I mentioned, in China, there's a lot of research, but of course, research is all over the world. Uh, uh, lots of people, I mean, my own master's when I did it a few years ago, my, my thesis was on uh, business English as well. 
Um, and so there you're looking at stuff in terms of collecting data, and that's your bias. You're not really worried about teaching and learning and so on. You're looking at how can I collect data? How can I use it uh, in order to complete my research project? Again, a different perspective. And finally, I've got something here called a training provider that might be a department inside a company. Um, it might be a language school, whoever it is. Um, and of course, publishers are trying to sell books and they're trying to get people into the training so that they can justify their existence, earn money in order to keep going as a business. So um, all these different perspectives mean that people have different priorities when it comes to course design, when it comes to teacher qualifications, when it comes to how much teachers get paid, all sorts of things come into the real world of business English. Um, if you think about some of the huge training providers which exist a lot across the world now, uh, I don't know if you've been following some of the online training providers which have popped up in the last six months, nine months because of COVID. And because they're able to um, uh, employ people from anywhere in the world, online training, and pay them very, very little money, um, the whole way Business English is being taught online is going through a huge um, huge changes at the moment. Um, and in fact, if you live in a, in a more expensive, high, high, uh, a richer country, high economy country, I do in Germany, for example, it's becoming harder because you're now competing with online training with everybody in the world. And of course, there are native speakers and uh, very competent speakers of English all over the world who can operate at far less cost than it, it costs for somebody in, say, Europe or America. So we're talking about the language of the workplace. What is the language of the workplace? This is the key part of business English, of course. Here's a, um, um, a German manager. I asked him to write down how he uses language, how he uses English during the day. And this is a typical, typical day, uh, 9.05, answering an IT question, 10 o'clock, 45 minutes status meeting with a Dutch developer team, uh, 11.35, writing a solution for an incident, five minute support system, and so on and so on and so on. This is very, very typical of many, many business English learners. They're using English all day long, and you get one phone call, you speak English for five minutes, then you go back into your language, then perhaps you have another language. This is very, very common. And I think now we're beginning to understand that in, in our teaching world, in our EFL and business English world, and now there are lots of discussions about things like code switching and translanguaging and uh, English as a lingua franca, which allows this use of other languages and this, this continual chopping and changing. When I started English teaching, the, 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 the sort of rule was you had to only speak English in the class. This has now changed to reflect what's actually happening in, in real life. Here's a Chinese manager. Um, and again, it's the same sort of thing, 9.30 emails in English, 11 o'clock meeting, uh, the presentation is English, conversation in Mandarin, very, very common in companies all over the world. 1400 hours, uh, meeting with colleagues face to face, but mostly in Mandarin. Uh, the next part is fully in Mandarin. And then it's web chat, so writing and mail and talking in English, helping somebody. Um, then discussing a task, again, uh, presentation in English, conversation in Mandarin. And then interesting, this chap spends half an hour every day um, looking at uh, different websites in English. I don't know if he does this to improve his English or if he does it because that happens to be the areas his company needs him to look at, but that's all in English. So this is very, very typical all over the world. People in business, international business, are using more than one language all the time. I suspect the only people who aren't are the native speakers. Um, Lots of different genres in, in workplace English. This is a well-known list from Almut Costa, but there are many different lists. And you can see um, these are genres in the sense of communicative events. So things you do, uh, events that happen in using business English in order to communicate. So you might have uni unidirectional, which is from one person doing most of the talking like this. You might have collaborative, where it's a discussion. You might have something which has nothing to do with work, non-transactional. Um, and there it's all about gossip and small talk. Of course, it is related to work, but it's not clearly directly related to the work you're doing at the moment. And these spoken genres, there are many, many different lists. Uh, and of course, there are very well-known written genres as well. 
the key thing about business English is that we have to understand the genre. And that is probably one of the biggest challenges, I think, for us as teachers coming in from outside, because the users who operate in a community of practice, in other words, they use language in a certain way, develop ways of using language as a group in a specific context. And we come in from outside and we have to try and understand the way they communicate. We have to understand their genres. Um, very often, some of these people expect us to tell them what's right and wrong. And that's almost impossible for us to do when we come in from outside. I spent many years in a big multinational looking at uh, different trainers, so visiting trainers and watching them in action. And a number of times I sat at the back of the room and gripped my teeth as um, trainers said, no, 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 you can't say that, you should say this. And those trainers didn't actually know what they were talking about. They were just using their intuition as maybe native speakers or as experienced teachers, or because they wanted to sound as if they knew what they were talking about. And actually they were giving very, very poor advice. And I think it's a big challenge in our industry for us to say, sorry, I don't know, I can find out, I can speak to people who do this and come back to you. Um, but that's, that's the genre is not as simple as it looks. Then this slide, it's presentations as a genre. There are so many types of presentations. You know, the number of people who have told me over the years, you must have fantastic pictures in your presentations. Well, not in some companies and in some contexts, absolutely not. If you're doing a technical presentation um, and you're producing data, which you have to discuss and everybody in the room needs to look at that data, then you don't start bringing in pictures of beaches and, and birds flying around the beaches and the sun shining because it's a different sort of presentation. So understanding this, what our clients, what our learners need to be able to do is absolutely vital, I think, as in business English. So this genre idea, of course, this is one of the challenges. There's the linguistic stuff in the sense that all meetings have a certain type of language, all emails have a certain type of language. So that's stable, that's static, that's the stuff we can teach, we can look at research and find out about it. But then the context, the specific context, always brings in some sort of dynamic so some fluidity to the situation. And so it's this balance between teaching people what they can do and being flexible enough to say, yes, you can do that as well, or you can't. And it's very difficult to be black and white about these things. Very, very difficult as an outsider. This is uh, Flower Dew, and I love this quote. He says, somebody participating in a genre who does not have a command of these patterns and the limits to their possible variability is quickly recognized as either incompetent or an outsider. So our job is to stop them sounding incompetent or an outsider. So we have to really try and spend time understanding the specific patterns, what is allowed and what isn't allowed in a particular context. Very hard to do. Um, Susanna Ehrenreich, a, a, a well-known researcher in business English as a lingua franca, wrote this. She, she researched um, um, uh, language use in a multinational in Germany and she said learning to cope with the challenges of this diversity of being able to adjust all the time in the context of business communication seems to happen most effectively in business communities of practice rather than in traditional English training. What she's saying was basically you learn this stuff when you work in the community of practice. You don't learn it in traditional business English classes because in a bit, traditional business English class, nobody's using the language you actually need to be able to, to learn. The teacher certainly isn't because the teacher's probably never done that target, target discourse themselves. Here's another one, Mike Hanford. Mike Hanford is a well-known uh, researcher in, in business uh, English. Um, he wrote a very well-known book called The Language of Business Meetings. And he said the most important issue in business is not language ability, but the experience and ability to dynamically maneuver within the communities of practice which business people inhabit. This is what we're trying to achieve as business English teachers, teaching people how to do this, not learning, you know, how to use the present perfect absolutely correctly in every situation. Um, that's maybe language training, but business English is a little bit different in priorities. So how is language? different the workplace language different well it's goal oriented of course people have a goal um, they're using specific lexis in a specific context it's very often asymmetrical 
asymmetrical means that one person has more power in the conversation than the other. For example, a manager talking to the employee, it's not an equal conversation. Um, and a lot of business English is asymmetrical. A negotiator, a buyer and a seller have different power in a conversation. Um, business English is of course used as an international language, as a lingua franca. Uh, it is genre based as we've just seen, very context specific. Um, it's work related and social um, and it requires expertise. You can't just speak business English, you have to know about your business as well in order to uh, work. So how do we do it? Well, first big decision is, are we teaching the language about business or the language of doing business? This is a big, big issue because they're different things. Language of talking about business is this sort of stuff. This stuff you very often find in universities. You look at interviews, you look at management theory, you discuss academic articles, business studies, you watch the news. And you can learn a lot about business English, but you're not actually learning the language of doing business, which is this sort of thing. Completely different focus in terms of a syllabus, in terms of what you do in a class. And I think this is an important decision which everybody has to make as a business English teacher. What are you actually teaching? Course books very often focus on the, the top ones. You know, that you have every chapter starts off with a, an article from a newspaper, which you then have to read and comprehend and discuss and answer questions and then do some vocabulary exercises and so on. And that's fine, that's business English, but it's different to the language of learning how to write emails about complicated things, which is what happens if you go into a corporate situation. You remember Oksana talking about her situation. Of course, what we're doing basically as trainers is finding the gap. So we're looking at um, the communication. We're trying to work out where they need to be first. So what is the target they need to achieve? Then we can assess, then we can test them, see what the gap is. So compare where they are now to where they need to be, find the gap. And that is the major task of any business English trainer. And what makes business English a bit different to other types of English is finding this training gap. And then we move into the normal um, skills and techniques, which we all know as teachers. Um, we know, for example, that to learn a language, there has to be some sort of input of language. There has to be some sort of chance to practice. Um, there has to be some sort of motivation. Without these three things, there's probably not going to be much learning of language. Teachers aren't necessary to learn a language. And there are many, many ways of, of doing this, of course. But these are the basic three things most language learners will need in order to be successful. And we use techniques like present, practice, and uh, produce, uh, PPP, which you will have covered if you've certainly done a, a CELTA or a DELTA or one of the British types of um, um, uh, qualifications. So we present the language, we then give a chance to practice it, and then we ask them in some sort of task to produce the language. Or, which is very common in business English, we do task-based learning, where you give people a task and then you give them feedback on the language and on the task itself. So the task is a negotiation and you say, oh, maybe you could have done this better with language and maybe your tactics in the negotiation could have changed as well. So we're giving two types of feedback on task-based learning. And this, might, this circle might go round and round again. You might do the task several times. And of course, there's blended learning. Blended learning we all know and love, I think this year, face-to-face, -face, maybe, probably more distance now, online uh, training. We call this blended learning if there's a bit of both. Um, and this is now becoming very, very common and has its own techniques, which I'm not going to go into now, obviously. So what are the critical success factors um, in this world of business English? Well, I think there are four things, really. We really need to focus on evidence rather than intuition. It's all very well. We've done it for years. Um, but our, I think our learners and our students are beginning to realize that sometimes as teachers, we don't really know what we're talking about. And it's much better to hold your hand up and say, I don't know, I can find out. Um, and having a real interest in gathering what happens in business interactions, in workplace interactions, rather than just assuming it's the English I know because I'm very good at English and you're not. Uh, we have to work hard at that. And then I think we have to discuss this idea of are we teaching the language of doing business? Do our learners need to do business in English or do they need to talk about it in an academic sense? These are very different 
uh, focus areas. Maybe that's the difference between English at, in the university context and English in a corporate context. The sort of stuff I've done in many, many companies over the years, there's almost no resemblance to the stuff that people do in universities um, because it's different priorities, different needs, different, different aims of the courses. I think we really need to work hard as an industry and talk to each other a lot more. And this is why Braz TSOL, BSIC, and all the other BSICs in the world, these are so useful because they're ways of people connecting with each other and sharing ideas and sharing um, uh, concerns and worries about where we're going and, and where the priorities are. But I think uh, businesses and academic and language schools really need to talk to each other a lot more than they're doing now. And of course, we need to have trained teachers. Now, I know this is the subject of the next talk, but I'm going to cover a couple of things and then I know Karen is going to talk about it in a lot more detail. Um, what is a trained business English teacher? Ask 10 business English teachers and you'll get 20 answers. It's really a huge discussion. Um, I think one of the factors, of course, is the ability to operate in different contexts. So here, these are no, not in any particular order. Um, you could be an expert in language school or in university or in corporate training. You could be freelance or used to marketing yourself and, and so on, all the way through that list. Um, you can look at that later in the recording if you want in more detail. Um, but different contexts require different competencies. And if you're looking for a teacher, if you wanted to hire a teacher yourself, would you put somebody in a specific context who hasn't got any experience or knowledge about it? I mean, I, I very often go and do teacher training in China, but I think I would probably die if I had to teach some of the classes they have to teach. You know, where you have 50, 100, 200 people, the teacher is using a microphone, um, the students very rarely um, talk in the class, in these large classes. Uh, there's a lot of work done outside the class. These are such different contexts, such different areas to my own expertise, which is working with very small groups in companies and corporates and trying to work out their really detailed needs. So, you know, if you're looking for a university teacher in China, don't come to me. I'm maybe got experience in something else and so these trainer competencies there's no such thing in my opinion as a business teacher who can do all these things i think we we, we are experts in certain areas and we can move of course from areas to other areas and that's where our experience and our qualifications come in so if you have got qualifications which teach you how to be a, a business english teacher and maybe a master's degree or maybe uh, one of the initial certificates like the FTBE or the cert TEB, then then these will help you um, adapt and move from context to context. Um, without this experience and qualifications and all the things we've been talking about before, I'm not sure we can teach business English. So I think we all need to be aware of the people who come in and say, I was a businessman. I was in business for 20, 25 years. I am much better at business English teaching than any teacher. Because of course, they're different skills. They come in with very knowledge of some aspects of business wherever they worked they'll only know that particular industry or that particular profession perhaps and they will have a lot of competence at that but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're trained teachers able to help other people um, learn this uh, language or trained teachers who can analyze have the skills to analyze communication find out where the miscommunication is and then move on from that so i think all these things come into what is being a trained teacher this is a company i worked with and these are the areas they looked at. Um, they looked at results. So every course had feedback sheets and statistics done. And I put that in bold because that was absolutely number one priority. If you didn't get good results, you didn't come back for another course. It was as simple as that. And then there were other things they decided were important as part of the trainer competency, knowing about the company, being a competent teacher, being a competent trainer, so having qualifications, etc. Being an expert in a specific area, so maybe you're an expert in teaching the language of negotiations or the language of project management, and then also cooperating with the language department within the corporation so that you didn't cause problems and didn't cause um, uh, time wasting for the, for the, for the department. Um, if you go to the European profile grid, you may have come across this. Um, here it's divided into these four areas, training and qualifications, teaching competencies, enabling competencies, and professionalism. I'll go through those very quickly. Training and qualifications, nothing surprising there. Language proficiency, your training. Have you been assessed? Has somebody come and watched you 
and assessed you as a teacher. A lot of business English teachers have never been properly assessed. And then, of course, your teaching experience. Uh, if you look at teaching competencies, do you know about the different methodologies? Do you know the difference between doing task-based learning and PPP, or the advantages and disadvantages of using a coaching um, technique in certain contexts? When do you use it? When, when is it not appropriate? These sorts of things. How much do you know about assessment? How to assess people's language um, skills? How do you know, what do you know about a lesson and course planning in terms of needs analysis, in terms of putting a course together? These are skills which you can't just pull out of the air. These are skills which uh, need to be learned. Um, teachers teaching in business English probably have things like intercultural competence and awareness of language, skills with using digital media, and of course, professionalism in terms of how they operate within the business English context. And what happens is if you use this grid, you just fill it in for your teachers in your language school and you can compare and then match your teachers perhaps to the situations where you want to use them. Um, the world of business English is full of networking and I'm very happy to see Braz Tisol Bisik right in there in the center of, of the world doing this, but there are so many of these organizations. All of them are very welcoming. All of them are very uh, keen to network. That's what they're all there for. So, you know, if you have time, go online. You can use all the different uh, social media channels nowadays and you can spend your whole time networking and learning from other people and never doing any work, to be honest. There's so much going on around the world. So I strongly recommend if you're serious about business English and want to know more about the world of business English, then look at this. One last thing, um, I'm, I'm involved in another BSIC, IATEFL BSIC. Um, you can look it up later, bsic.iatefl.org. But in a couple of weeks, we have a big online conference. It's free or very, very cheap, depending if you're a member or a non-member. But even non-members can come in for free. There's a scheme to help pay for people. And we've got 72 talks all on business English. Um, so strongly recommend if you want to know about the world of business English teaching, come and join us. It's going to be a fantastic three days, three full days of fantastic talks and presentations. So that's all I have to say about the world of business English. I know it was very fast, very rushed through. Uh, and I know the next talks are going to be even more enlightening and even more interesting. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Ricardo, I moved okay. quite fast, so uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions. No, absolutely. Uh, we it's a pleasure to to have you here, and yes, we are open to to questions. Just checking on uh, on the the YouTube live. Uh, we are just emphasize here that if you have questions uh, from the participants, please uh, share them on the, the chat from the, the, the YouTube. But of course, I have questions. Yeah, I have questions. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to have you uh, with us, uh, Evan. You, in the very beginning of your talk, you talked about uh, that uh, business English is usually uh, material uh, lad and not necessarily research lad, uh, right? Uh, how do you think that it's possible to, what is the, the, the main reason that, uh, uh, or maybe I think that my question is how we can change uh, this and allow uh, professionals to be a bit more uh, inquisitive and investigate and get closer to the reality of companies sure. uh, so they can better understand the environment. Yeah, it's, a, it's a really good question and one which we've been discussing in the profession ever since I've been involved. And there's no re real easy answer, I think, because it's all so dependent on context. Certainly, when I've worked in, in big multinationals um, who have recognized that uh, there is a need to understand the types of communication before you can prepare people to work in it, then there is money and resources. I've just been approached, for example, to, to look at an organization next year uh, in the Middle East, and they have said the first nine months will be needs analysis before we start writing materials or teaching. So nine months of walking around departments, um, investigating, speaking to different stakeholders, finding out what they want and so on. So these things do happen, but I think that's rare in, a, in business English. Most business English teachers get put in a class, get told what book, 
get told you have three people at uh, V1 and three people at V1 plus and uh, make sure you keep them happy, you know, and they're extremes. And that's that's the world of business English. Um, I think if you can persuade people, use your skills to say, look, the benefits of me researching how you communicate and where your problems are will lead to better value for your company. But it's very hard and it's very hard depending on the context. Ricardo, you and I have discussed this for many times. I, mean, I know, just, I, just making use of no the opportunity. Answer. Because... There's really <laughs> no easy answer. And of course, the public, oh. publishers are exactly the same problem. They, they want to publish stuff and, and they, they publish what is generally acceptable, but not necessarily specific to context. You know. Okay, thank you once again to promote the concept that business English is a language to make, to have people have their job done, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I do believe that uh, there's a moment where uh, the language learner perceives that he needs something that is completely different that he has been uh, learning from a uh, regular uh, language teaching path. Yeah. And he takes uh, control of it and say, okay, I need this language to, to do things in a completely different way. I'm responding for the company, for the business I, I work for and so on and so forth. Yes, I think learner autonomy the learner has full responsibility here. It's not the teacher making all the decisions at all. We are there to help, we are there to facilitate. If the learners don't want to learn, then there's not a lot we're gonna be able to do. We can help them, Absolutely. we can make it more fun, we can make it more interesting, we can make it more structured. But uh, this is adult education, this is not children's education. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And thanks, uh, among the, the profiles I shared, um, I would say that, uh, and I believe that the, the community can agree with that as well, that most of us here uh, do identify ourselves as the profile of Oksana working as a freelance uh, and delivering classes uh, or working for our school, but mostly working by themselves and delivering business English classes uh, in company this year, of course, online. <laughs> yes, but I'm sure there are many people in Brazil who, who teach ESP and business classes in universities. You know, there, there must be thousands of them. <laughs> you know, there are universities oh. everywhere in Brazil. Exactly, and, yes. and, and people on MBA courses, people learning engineering, people learning finance, they're all doing business English in universities. It's a big part of business English. It's certainly a big part. Um, I think there's one type of trainer which I didn't mention, which is the, some people call it in-house trainer or embedded trainer, where you work full-time in a corporation. Um, I, I was lucky enough to do this for several years, and it's a very different situation because you really become knowledgeable about the local context. Um, but I, I'm not sure that's that's uh, the mainstream of business English. I think that's very few people are actually able to do that full time um, for one okay. department or one company. Mm -hmm. And would you say that this would you say that this demand came first from the company, or there was there was first a, a, a process of uh, getting convinced that okay this is something interesting for, for us and we think I that think, this i think it was basically uh, the people i know who are doing it were very hard at marketing they went into companies they knocked on doors and they said look you can go to language schools you can do this you can do this however if you do it this way um it will bring you more value in the long long term uh, you can deal with confidential issues that person becomes an employee of the company um, they know the company inside out and, and so on and so on and so on. I think the problem is changing the mindset of company owners, HR managers into thinking about business English as or business communication as something the company does all the time. You know, they think of it in terms of lessons, in terms of 40 minutes a week. And that's not that's not what in company training is. It's much more what Oksana said, where people ring you up and say, hey, I've got an email, help, you know. But it's, it's very tricky, very, very tricky in every country I've ever worked in, this, this idea. I know in China, so many people told me, this doesn't happen in China, we don't have in-company trainers. And I went to one meeting where we only met 20 or 30 company managers and HR people, and they came and we had a get together and we were talking about business English. And one of them said to me, Evan, don't be stupid. Every single company in China, which is doing business abroad, has an in-house trainer. They just don't call it a trainer. Maybe it's called a translator, maybe it's called a communication expert, maybe it's called the English something, but everybody has them because you cannot do business without it. 
You just can't do it. You can't do business if all you do is send somebody to a school once a week. You know, everybody's got their English in-house English experts. They have to. Yes, essentially being flexible as possible, right? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I would like to also invite uh, Carla and, and Isabel from our BC Hello, board. Guys. Hi. I well, it's you. a pleasure to have you here. And I have a question, a quick question. How do we, uh, this is something that I have faced and I see lots of teachers facing. How do we encourage our students to participate in the building of the course? Because I mean, uh, we are English teachers, English specialists, and they're specialists in their areas. And sometimes education is really top down. Like yes. the teacher has to know it all. And that's what the student wants from us. Yes, that's what they expect for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So you're right, you're absolutely right. I think that's a, that's a big challenge. Uh, I think it's it's uh, certainly I've used tricks like bringing in the department head or the or the supervisor into the class uh, to show that the company has an interest, and sitting down on day one and saying, "Okay, guys, let's negotiate the syllabus. What do people want from this?" And of course, it's an ongoing thing because people don't know what they want. They have no idea what they want. Exactly. They don't, they don't know how to define it in in the words that we use. If a learner says grammar. And we say grammar, these are completely different words. You know, we have years and years and years of understanding different approaches to grammar, different understanding. And, and so it's it's an ongoing process. I, I absolutely agree with you, Carla. And sometimes you don't win this one. You just have to be top exactly. down. Exactly. <laughs> and in some countries, it's a cult, it's a, it's different cultures, different countries have different learning strategies. You know, China is much more top down than say uh, Germany. And, and to, you know, the teacher is the boss in China. They, the one with the microphone, perhaps, you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, Evan. It's so good Hi, to Isabel. see you. Nice to see you. Um, I do have a question uh, regarding something you said at the beginning, uh, which is that English, uh, business English is about doing your job and it's not necessarily learning the language itself. So how do we go about that? Since in Brazil, we have um, many students who are at a beginner level, but they need English for meetings and communication with foreign clients, for example. That's a standard business learner across the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How do you do it? I don't know. I mean, I think you have to try and identify with them and bring them in into your, agree with you that where the priorities are, you have to say, look, you're not going to learn everything. This is not English at school where you're going to learn English at the end. You're going to be able to do some things very, very well and some things you're not going to be able to do at all. Um, and in fact, if you look at things like the CEFR, I don't know if that's popular in Brazil, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, it actually says people can be good at writing and not good at speaking. And people can be good at speaking, but not good at a certain type of speaking they can be good at listening in meetings but not leading the meeting and so on and so i think you have to make your priorities and just say i can help you but it's going to be focused training on these very very specific skills i've certainly done that in call centers for example where we've worked really hard for people to be able to in a call center you'll normally get maybe 10 or 15 questions and they're always the same questions and you can really train people to be able to sound very professional at answering those 15 questions. If they get another question, they can't do it, you know? So I guess what you're talking about is ESP, really focusing in on the specific needs and then and then only working on that. I'll give you another example. I worked in um, Korea a couple of years ago and I had a class of people who work on ships and uh, I was told they were intermediate and that was fine. I had a whole load of materials which were given to me and I was ready to go. And then uh, I went in and before the class started, I did my normal thing. I did some small talk with people and nobody could answer me. And they were all blank. And I was really, really panicking because these people were not intermediate for me. They could not talk about what they did on the weekend. They could not talk about the sports and so on. And then we, the lesson was about um, sinking ships and what to say in an emergency. And boom, they were all much better than me at it. They knew exactly what to say. They had all the specific jargon. They had been coached very specifically in the area they needed. They didn't need to learn small talk, so they never learned it, you know. Um, and this is what goes back to Carla's question. You have to sit down with them and say, 
What do you need? Where are your priorities? Let's focus on. But most of us don't get that chance because that's everybody in the room has to have the same priorities in that situation. And of course, in a language school, or if you've got people from different departments, they have very different priorities. And then you have to move into something which is more of a compromise, I guess. It's not easy. It's, it's, we haven't got all the answers in this business, that's for sure. <laughs> so Thank <maybe>. you. <laughs> okay, okay. Evan, we have a question from our chat box. Uh... Uh, LB, English Personalizado, asks us, what would you recommend for those business English teachers who have already taken a course into business English, such as, for example, the CERT I bet? You, you mean finding jobs or, or you, once they've already got their certificate? You mean, yes. No. Yeah, if they have the certificate, then they have to, I mean, they have to find somebody who's going to employ them, I guess. Is that what you're saying? How to find employment? Um, and I guess in some ways that's also marketing to language schools who may not be familiar with the latest business English. Um, and so you have to be able to explain to people the advantages that you have of having a cert IBET. And it shows that you've got an interest, that you're focused on something. This is an international cert. You've got an advantage which other people, your competitors for a job perhaps don't have. Um, but, you know, you, you can use it and you can say the same uh, same arguments with people in companies you still got to make the contact you still got to sell yourself if you're an individual as a freelancer you know 50 of your time is marketing it's not teaching you know absolutely and in fact the ftbe the other course there's a lot of um, how to sell yourself to clients and 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 you know the arguments to to sell yourself what are the advantages and disadvantages of using you as a trainer and i think that's a that's an important part of being a freelance trainer selling yourself you can be the best trainer in the world. If you can't sell yourself, it doesn't really matter. You know? Totally. Another question we have is say, how to prove the values of having business English uh, classes inside the companies, even, even though uh, national companies, so not, not necessarily multinational companies. I understand that the question has to do with how to convince companies that this is something important, basically. Yeah. Well, I think the way the way to do it is to find specific examples where the training has changed how people operate in, in the job. In other words, you have to show that the sort of value it brings in a specific context. So, for example, in the call center, when I just explained uh, what we did uh, was we recorded everybody answering the phone at the beginning of the course. Then we recorded them at the end of the course and there were differences. And we could show that to the HR manager and say, look, this is what the training did. We did a proper needs analysis. We analyzed what they needed to do. And I can prove that they improved, you know. Um, and so you can find examples like that in your own context, perhaps. But it's very difficult to do that in the short term. You've got to, training takes a long time. Identifiable improvements takes a long time sometimes. You can also, of course, have um, um, recommendations from past students who said yes this person has helped me do my job better and you see these on linkedin sometimes for, for in people's profiles linkedin profiles where teachers have persuaded students to do this you know um yeah i can see karen is ready to go so uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should stop talking absolutely uh, but i'm uh, going to be around for the next four hours so i'm looking yeah we, we can talk about four hours about business english teaching practice uh, thank you very, thank much, you very much for coming. Thanks, guys. Thanks uh, for the and by the way, uh, have a, I wish you guys a fantastic preparation for the Atafo BC conference. Which well, I hope to see you there, Ricardo. Absolutely, I am. <laughs> You're giving it. <laughs> so I'm just inviting people to to join because I believe this is the very last day for, for registration, right? So today is the last day for registration, but the point is that we've got a lot of people who have donated money. So even if you don't want to pay your ten pounds, you can come in as a non-member. There are a lot of slots which are free wherever you are in right. the world. So don't let Fantastic. the money stop you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Evan. <laughs>
Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in language and, and also has a background in law. Um, Karin um, Galvão has worked in ELT and training for nearly two decades. She also holds the CELTA and CP certificates, uh, as well as the IH Colt. At I Study Interactive Learning, a language school based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, she works as director of studies. And Karin, I saw yesterday, uh, it's been, it was the thir 13th anniversary of I Study, uh, so congratulations. And she is also a Google educator and also works as a teacher and teacher trainer specialized in business English. Uh, she holds certificates as life and executive coach by the European Mentoring and Coaching Council, International Association of Coaching, the Professional Coaching Alliance, the Association for Coaching, and Sociedade Latinoamericana de Coaching. She also works closely with the international leadership programs as a corporate trainer and behavior analyst. And she's currently working with European and American multinational corporations, developing their language strategies for their Latin America branches, as well as assessing candidates for relocating purposes. So please, Katty, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, can you all hear me all right? Absolutely, Karine. Welcome aboard. All right. Great. So I'll just, can I start sharing my screen? Absolutely. All right. All right. Can you can you see everything? Is everything okay? I cannot particularly see your screen. I can see it. Yeah? I mm -hmm. can too. Okay, you perfectly. You can't? Not perfectly. Oh, great. All right. Yes. So, game on. <laughs> Yeah. So everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining me this afternoon. And I know um, it's been tough, right? Uh, especially nowadays with the whole COVID scenario. I mean, we're trying to do our best here because everybody's pretty tired, but you're here in a, on a Saturday afternoon. I'm sure you're looking for development. So... Uh, my topic today um, is what does it take to be a BE teacher? And I can tell you in advance that some of the things that Evan has mentioned, I will mention them again, but from a different perspective, okay? From the perspective of a business English teacher based in Brazil um, with a different kind of contest that I have to deal here. And also, a woman's perspective, if I can say that, all right. So let me just start by telling you how I started. Um, of course, I started teaching general English long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> you know. And uh, of course, the first time I had to teach a business English group it was quite challenging. Uh, the coordinator just came to me back in the day, I used to teach in a language school who, who shall not be named. <laughs> but uh, they just told me, just go and here's the material. Here's the address of the company. It was an in-company, you know, kind of course. And go there and teach. Um, as you can see, I look pretty young. Okay, I look pretty young. So back in the day, I looked like a fetus. So I don't know. <laughs> um, it was pretty intimidating to go into a company and having to teach a group of business men um, how to do business communication, you know. And to tell you the truth, I had no idea about what I was doing, I just had the material. I, of course, at the time I was studying 
law, but law and business, they're related, <laughs> you know, they're cousins, let's say, but they're not necessarily the same, right? So for me, it was really intimidating. It was really intimidating at the time. So, um, but I just said, you know what? I need this job. I need to work. So this is what I'm going to do. And this, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what happens in many cases in many um, business English scenarios here. I mean, people just are thrown in this room and they expect you to teach business English as if it's just like any other class. So, of course, everything I knew about teaching English, general English, I transferred to this business context. Little did I know that that was not what you were supposed to do at all. So I, heard, I had to learn the hard way, you know. You get punched in the face sometimes, you know, by your own mistakes. And, uh, of course, um, it was a difficult a moment, especially being the only woman in the girl, I would say, <laughs> in the classroom. But it was uh, also, how can I put it, this enlightening. <laughs> okay, so I realized uh, day after day, and then I start getting more um, business English um, courses and groups and whatever that even though I had some training in, in teaching English, I shouldn't just stay in this um, context. What I'm trying to say is, okay, you have a CELTA, you have a background in languages, you have a degree, you have a master's degree in linguistics. I'm sorry to break the news, but it doesn't work like that, okay? Especially, and again, I'm coming, this perspective here is from a person teaching English in Latin America, okay? Especially in Brazil. So it's really not black and white. It's, there are lots of gray areas here and uh, please have this in mind while I talk. I know that um, Evan brought here many different ideas especially like how you could improve yourself how could you start you could start what kind of books uh, you could read like his for example um, but it's not black and white here in Brazil we still have to develop uh, on that on that particular area okay so this is how I started I was just thrown in the classroom with the lions actually with the sharks <laughs> <laughs> and I had to try to survive. And thankfully, I did. Uh, it doesn't mean it was easy. So before we start, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about business. I know that Evan talked to you about business English, but let's talk about business. So what is business? What do you understand by business? Do you think business has to do with, let's say, finances, maybe marketing? Maybe it has to do with, I don't know, accounting or... So you see, it's so difficult for you to actually answer this question because it has to do with so many different things at the same time and we cannot just um, think that okay I understand business I own a business and this is going to be just piece of cake come to class and I know what I'm talking about no so again, it really depends on who your students are. As Evan just mentioned, do you teach people from IT, from marketing, 
So these people, they want different things. They have different purposes, right? So when, again, when we talk about business, what are you really talking about? Try to ask yourself that. What does it mean to, to mention, even mention business? Okay. So having this in mind, what does it mean to teach business English? You know what business English is. You have many quotes from Evan from different books. If you ask this question to different teachers around the world, they're going to give you different answers, as you could see from the videos that Evan uh, shared with us. But what does it mean to teach business English? So to me, it means getting to know the students in a way that they can perform their work, they can deliver their, their work in a more efficient way. To me, it means that my student who's doing, who's working on a deal for, you know, multinational companies like around million, a million, two million, or even worse, like billions. To me, it means that they did their job right and they actually got a contract that was signed, you know. It doesn't mean to me that teaching business English is having to teach a aulinha de presence perfect, okay? <laughs> this doesn't mean to me business English. Business English it, to me means that you are part and partners with your students. To me, it means getting to know how their work routine is, if they have um, a fixed schedule or not, if they are responsible to uh, you know delivering results by a certain time for example but like during a certain period of time frame like people from finances they always have deadlines that are usually like the end of the month the beginning of the month so i know for instance that to those students i can't ask for much homework you know i cannot expect homework in the beginning or the end of the month so for instance today is october 31st happy halloween everybody but i'm not going to expect my student who works in the financial department of a multinational company to deliver her homework next week it's the first week of the month it's insane for them so Again, what does it mean to teach business English? You see, it's such a complex um, question to answer. It's not only opening, you know, market leader or whatever book you use. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I use market leader. Okay. But it's not only textbook related. It's about understanding people, understand their purposes uh, with the the i mean with the courses that they're taking and understanding that english is a tool understanding that english is a tool just like your computer just like your phone and because they speak english they will be better able to deliver results and it's just you know it's not the end it's actually everything around. So many people say that, you know, like um, Spanish is the language of passion or Italian, the language of love, whatever. You know, people say things, I don't, it doesn't, but English is the language of business. If you want to do business and you want to do it well and you want to work internationally, you have to speak English and you have to do it in a way that people not only understand you and understand what you want, they understand what, you know, uh, you want from them, but also that uh, you'll be better able to reach other people, other places. 
So for instance, today I work not only in Brazil anymore, but um, I work with people from Holland. I work with people from Canada, from the US, from, I work with students in Chile and Colombia. So no, I don't work with, with Portuguese speakers anymore as students uh, only. So I have other, so it, it allowed me to, to have clients in other places. And when I say clients also, please forgive me when I use this word, because I know in education, the word client doesn't sound so great, but sometimes your client is not your student. The client is the company who hired you. So again, what does it really mean to teach business English? I'm not taking English out of the equation, don't get me wrong, but English is not the focus point anymore. The focus point is the billion dollar deal, if you know what I mean. So again, do you have what it takes? Do you have any idea how to do this? Okay, so we, we had there some examples that Evan brought us of different contexts. And I will tell you, it's an, again, it's not black and white. It's all shades of gray. Um, but first of all, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to do that? And I'm not trying to come here, you know, with my jacket and people say, oh, of course, um, if you're a business English teacher, you're supposed to be more serious or whatever, you know? This is not the point. Not really, really, <laughs> you know? The point is, are you willing to do this? For instance, I'm not willing to teach kids. I can teach kids. I have one student who's eight and my son. <laughs> But do I want to work with children? And I'm not saying that the, the people, the, 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 the teachers who work with children are not as good as a business English teacher, not at all, because I cannot do what they do, you know? Again, it's just trying to find your niche. When you think about going to class, are you excited to teach? business English? Does you, do you feel the butterflies in your stomach? Well, I do. Like, I can't wait to talk to my students about what is happening in the stock market. I can't wait to talk to them about, you know, uh, the whole COVID thing in their companies, what they're doing with all the remote uh, workers now that they have. Um, I can't wait to, to, to hear from them what they're going to say about um, confidentiality that is now happening, you know, with the data confidentiality thing. So again, do you have what it takes? But better yet, are you willing to do that? That's my question to you today. So here are a few things that I believe, I strongly believe, that a BE teacher must do or must have some qualities or skills, okay? Again, my perspective, I'm not coming from books, okay? <laughs> so, First of all, understand and constantly study about business in general. I'm talking about finances. I'm talking about marketing. I'm talking about, um, you know, IT. I'm talking about, God knows, you know, project management. You need to, to, to want to learn more about the topic, okay? You need to read uh, an article and feel excited about what is happening in the world in terms of business. And uh, more importantly, you need to be willing to study and understand what your student does. Because if you're, if you're thinking that teaching business English is just 
oh, I have this program, I created, I developed a course, and I can replicate this to everybody. It's not really like that. <laughs> Sorry to break the news. So this student has different purposes. This student has different skills. This student has the has a boss, you know, pressuring him or her saying, if you don't speak English by the end of the year, you're fired. Uh, so again, what you need to be willing to understand their own context. They are the specialists, they are the experts. And you need to be willing to allow your students to be the experts. So I believe Carla just asked a question about, you know, like being pretty much top down. And yeah, you're, again, you're working together. There's no, no such thing as you being the expert in the room. You understand English, but probably you don't know about tax legislation in Brazil as well as your student who works with that every single day. So again, study and understand doesn't mean you have to be the expert, okay? You also must be a leader and know when to be a follower. We have this idea that oh let's study leadership and let's all be leaders you know great i highly recommend that you study the topic but you also need to know um, how to take the back seat and let your student uh, be a leader at times you know um, evan mentioned about um, working with projects or test ba based learning in in companies or in any kind of business English um, classrooms. And sometimes you just have to observe. And, and then according to courses that are designed to teach you how to, I mean, teach you, <laughs> to train you how to teach you, they might think, oh, but you're not doing anything because this is not PPP or TBL or whatever, you know. Again, sometimes it's you have to be a follower and know where your student wants to go. So maybe your student came in with a certain demand from work and you need to tackle that immediately. So uh, be, be a leader as well as a follower. Be strategic and strategize. And the reason why I say differently is that when you are strategic, not necessarily you're strategizing um, in terms of what is going to help your students the best. You're being strategic when you're choosing the materials you're going to use, okay? But you strategize in terms of going to war, <laughs> okay? Because depending on who you're working with, and I've, I have students who are CEO, CFOs, and directors of like Latin America, or whatever. You need to strategize and you need to be prepared for the worst. For the worst case scenario, they might come into class thinking, okay, today's just an ordinary day. Or they might come into class saying, so I just had to fire. 50 people in the company, I'm devastated. So what, are you able to teach your lesson, <laughs> your aulinha de present perfect, present perfect? Probably not. So that's what I'm saying. Really, you need to have plan B, C, all the alphabet <laughs> with you, okay? Another thing you need to, to do, you must know how to negotiate and how to teach negotiation skills in, in, uh, in the international context. When I say negotiate, is that you're negotiating every single day. And I'm sure you negotiate at home when you talk to your husband and he says, oh, I want to have pizza. And then you say, but we had pizza last night, so maybe you should eat healthier today 
every day is a negotiation, you know, just you're taking this into another level and you're taking this into um, the international environment because of obviously your students are not learning English to stay in the country they are and to talk to the people in their native country, right? Because what's the point of learning another language for them to talk to people who don't speak their language, right? So negotiating in Brazil, and I can tell you from experience, it's pretty difficult because we have this idea that we always want a discount. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? You know. So we always ask for discount. And when your student is um, dealing with a company based in England or Germany, for instance, asking for a discount can be very offensive. So again, um, it's not black and white, you see? When you have a student who's working with people from China, there'll be hours and hours of negotiation before they say anything. So your student not only needs to understand the language, obviously, but they also need to understand how to cope with all this, you know, like having meals together, talking about other stuff. They want to get to know you outside the business, right? So what is negotiation after all? We need to understand this. And we need to um, be open to it, that's the word. We need to be open to um, maybe it's not like we do things in Brazil. And that is OK. So again, uh, talking about uh, international context, you must be an intercultural communicator. And the reason why I bring this, and I, I can't stress this enough, seriously, like if it's one thing for you to take from this talk, we need to understand and we need to be open to the idea that people communicate in different ways. And many times, not what we, what we say doesn't really mean what we're trying to say. Just the other day, I had this conversation with Rob Howard, who I think is watching me right now. Hi, Rob. And then I asked him, so it's this Saturday, right? And he's like, yeah, it's this Saturday. And I'm like, okay, so I wrote on my calendar. And then he's like, okay, so I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, no, it's next Saturday, the 31st. Like this Saturday or next Saturday? What do you mean? So maybe for you, it means something. And then another culture, uh, another culture means something else. Now those little details, like what is really appropriate? Is it appropriate for, for um, a woman to have their hair, you know, showing in the Middle East? Maybe not. I'm not here to judge. It's their culture. I'm not going into all the other details. I'm just saying, like, is it appropriate, for instance, for um, a person who's not the boss to talk in the meeting? You know, the person who's not in charge. Well, in Asia, many countries, like in Korea, for example, usually the person who's talking is not the person who's calling the shots. So again, we need to understand those little things, you know? It's so much more than English. It's so much more. If you have uh, an opportunity, just go into John Corbett's profile on Facebook, follow him. The guy is like the guy for international, uh, intercultural communication, okay? Fikajik. All right, <laughs> so 
Also, be a public speaker and teach and learn public speaking. What am I talking, uh, what do I mean by public speaking? Am I talking about something like this? For instance, me here talking to you? Yes. But any chance you have to speak in public, any chance. If it's for you to give an announcement, you know, at the school for all the employees to hear you or for you to go to reunião de condomínio, you know, and talk. I don't care. But you need to take all the chances you have for you to practice public speaking. Oh, but I'm just so shy. Okay, I work with shy people. I work with introverted people. Take this as a task that you have. I'm delivering the best announcement this school has ever heard. So that would be my idea for you to start practicing if you're not uh, so comfortable. You need to, of course, teach public speaking. And as Evan mentioned, public speaking, presentation skills, whatever you want to call. It's so vast. If I have a student who works with uh, finances, for example, probably this person is going to talk about numbers and charts, and most people might think it's boring. So how can we take that and make into a more interesting talk, right? Uh, and then I have another, another student from HR who's always training people and uh, working with uh, conflict and so on. So that's a different approach. And then they have a, a student who's going to speak in a conference and another student who's going to talk to the big boss, you know. Again, take the opportunity to analyze different talks. It's not just one thing, people. There's no such thing as let's learn presentation skills. Here is, you know, the recipe, follow that. <laughs> it's so vast. And allow yourself to understand that it's okay for you to make mistakes. I'm sure you're listening to me right now and thinking, oh my God, this person is so annoying. I hate her voice or I hate her clothes. Her, her setting is just crap. I said it there. So, <laughs> or you might be saying, oh, I loved her slides. Oh, they're boring because they're, they're gray. Again, what is the purpose? Why do you have this in mind? Learn, teach, and be involved in public speaking. Be adaptable. People, another point for you to take. It's like, this is number one priority for HR departments across the world. Like anywhere you go, if you talk to, to the head of HR, they're going to say, we need to have people that are adaptable. How are you going to work with people that are adaptable and you are not adaptable yourself? It doesn't make any sense. And don't say, oh, I'm so flexible. I'm so adaptable. You know, it means that you can have class today, this hour, and then maybe tomorrow in a different uh, slot, whatever. This is not being adaptable. Being adaptable is when your student comes to class and says, I need to write a report right now. I need you to help me. The deadline is in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. Obviously, you're going to feel a little bit uh, overwhelmed. Okay. Give you five seconds for you to feel like that. But see that as a challenge. Why not take this opportunity, you know? And tell, to tell you the truth, to me, this is the best thing. When my students come to class and they say, I need to finish this now. Please help me. Oh, my gosh, you know? Because it's, I don't care about my lesson plan. I care about them delivering. I care about my students closing the deals that they have to do, okay? Another thing, you must be tough. And uh, 
now my message is to all the girls out there please and i don't want to go into feminism blah 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 but i have to go there a little bit you need to be tough this thing uh, about teaching business english you're dealing with tough people you're going to get punched in the face with people that have better arguments than you do they have they are the experts in their fields you many times know nothing about what they're talking about and still you need to be tough enough to take it and girls yes this is it, the environment where boys rule but let me tell you something many times i have bigger balls than them <laughs> so you kind of come across sometimes as the bitch in the room so whatever you're like okay they're going to to say that i'm the bit i don't care anymore at this point i'm like dude are you delivering the report you need are you doing the the job you need to do so stop with the nonsense and uh, let's work okay so you need to be tough and you need to grow a pair sometimes there i said it it's going to be recorded and then later maybe <laughs> i'll hear about it but i said it and it takes a lot, especially, you know, in, a, in an environment where men pretty much control, you need to come to, to class and do it, you know, just don't, don't feel all like, oh, I'm cute. No, people, this is not the environment. You need to be understanding. You need to know how to work with people. Um, this is one of the things like I, for instance, went into behavior analysis. Now, this is one of the things I do. And uh, because I wanted to understand people's behavior and behaviors and reactions to things and how they operate uh, under stress and difficult situations. But you need to know yourself so deeply so you know when you be able to be tough okay tattoo on your arm be tough <laughs> and be humble as i said before you are not the expert in the room anymore and that is okay we have this foolish idea that we need to be the goddess and gods of all knowledge and there's no such thing you're there to help your students to to better communicate and it's okay for you to say i don't know what are you talking about hydraulics never heard of that of how do you do that in a cup to build a car never heard of that it's okay evan said that before it's okay you need to know how to to be humble and uh, tough at the same time and adaptable so maybe now you might be asking yourself oh my god how do i do that you know you're insane of course this is impossible well at first it can be overwhelming i'm not gonna lie to you it can okay you are just thrown at the deep end you know you have this cornucopia of skills that you need to to master um and uh, allegedly in our industry we're supposed to take all these courses and uh, certificates and god knows what well as i said before it's not black and white but don't fear my friends <laughs> first of all what you have to do is breathe okay breathe take a deep breath it's okay for you not to be again the expert it's okay for you to 
to feel overwhelmed. Do that, breathe, then you suck it up and then you decide if you want to do this or not. I'm not here to uh, ruin your dreams or anything. I'm just here uh, to, to be as honest as I can and uh, to tell you that it is possible actually. So here are some ideas for you on what you can do actually. Follow the news, people. When I say follow the news, I'm not talking about gossip. Well, sometimes, yes, because depending on the people on the gossip, they might be talking about business. So I'm talking about like really checking out content that you're not used to. I'm, I'm talking about not only reading about education anymore, it's not the focus point, remember? I'm not taking education for granted. Please forgive me if you understand that. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is bear in mind that these people are not educators. They're, and they are always uh, following everything. Like what is happening in the stock market? The, uh, what is happening to the exchange rate? right now please i want to travel people next year so what is going to happen these things are are important for you to bring to class read about business and when i say business i'm not talking about business english forgive me evan i know we have a book but i'm talking about business okay so the best way for you to start is harvard business review if you have Ever, you have no idea where to start. You start with Harvard Business Review. But you need to, under, to, to read about business, especially about the business your students do. Okay. But try to, to be in touch with that because it, it really changes the game, people. Learn about leadership. This is an association, Association for Tele, uh, Talent uh, Development. Uh, they have great programs. If you have no idea where to look, look for this uh, association. And they have courses, online courses, books, talks, whatever you need on leadership. Okay, you, we need to understand, we, not only to understand um, in terms of how we're going to do, but also, and more importantly, to understand the hierarchy inside the company your student is working. Uh, sometimes you're going to have students from the same company in the group. For instance, I have a group with uh, ladies from different departments, and there is hierarchy there. It's like one student is considered like the super boss and the others are uh, directors of their um, departments. So we need to understand leadership, we need to understand the structure of the companies, and we need to be open to um, the fact that there are different companies who work in different ways. There's some more traditional companies and others are not as traditional. Okay. You need to talk about business. When I say talk about business, you know that friend you have who is an accountant, talk to this friend. You know a friend you have who um, is a lawyer, talk to this person. You know that friend, talk to people that are outside of education. You, you need to understand what they do. And talk to people within education like ourselves about business. If you don't own your own business, you need to question business businesses in general so you need to exchange ideas with other teachers like we're doing today about business so um do you know how you do this how you write this contract exchange ideas it's so important which brings me to become a member of a freaking basic you know like, what is the best way for you to have all of, all of this at your fingertips be a member? There's, of course, the basic that you're watching this uh, lovely 
video recording for you later right now. However, there are bee sticks everywhere in Argentina, in Chile, in Japan, and of course the Ayatefo BSIG. That's how I got to know so many other people uh, in the industry. And they will bring you perspective, people that do what you do, that not necessarily do the same way, okay? But people, what, people that do what you do will allow you to see things from a different perspective. For instance, I work with companies that are German, based in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and so on. And I have, and I'm in touch with people in Germany who can explain to me how Germans operate, you know, if I'm in doubt of certain things. Again, be part of an active member of a community. And take your time, for the love of God, take your time. When I say this, it's like, don't think you need to do all of this, like tomorrow or right after my session, start reading about business like a maniac. No, take your time. And every experience is different. What I'm telling you today is from my experience, what has helped me after getting punched in the face many times. But what has helped me, and I'm sure it's not going to be the same experience as Evan. Evan's, you know, because he had he has a completely different background than me. But take your time. Allow yourself, you know, to breathe, read. And the more important question you have to ask yourself is, are you willing to do that? Okay. So, so do we have, do we, do all of us have what it takes? Sure. I'm positive that we do. Then again, ask yourself, do you want it? It's okay if you say you don't, but look, it's awesome. <laughs> I love it. I wouldn't chase this seriously. So I'd like to uh, finish here with a quote from Napoleon Hill. If you haven't read any books uh, from him, please do. So whatever the mind can believe and conceive, the mind can achieve. So believe in yourselves. Um, make sure you talk to people that uh, are outside of education as well. You know, take a peek. And I'm not saying for you to abandon your friends <laughs> from education. I'm just saying that if you are indeed willing, open, adaptable, if I can say, you know, and this, I don't, I don't come here as on with this concept of being, you know, of oh God, whatever. Um, challenge your own status quo. Try to, to think, I'm not saying outside the box, but outside of your own self. Maybe you will find the answers. Maybe you won't. But I hope I can see you in the, in the next Business English event with the Brassi So Basic. So everyone, thank you so much for today. And I hope we can get in touch. Thank you very much, Karin, for, for joining us this, this panel. And thanks a lot for your absolutely honest talk on... Very um, honest. <laughs> that's essential, I think. <laughs> yeah, many things to, to, to comment. And starting with the, the, the thing that, yes, as a business English teacher, you, you not only have your language teaching skills, you also have to look after some others <laughs> and they do yeah, and it's looking. okay it's okay for you to uh, question yourself i guess that's the, the the big thing you know like it's okay for you not to be the expert nor you shouldn't you know you, you shouldn't be the expert absolutely uh 
and on being uh, tough and humble. Thanks a lot for sharing your your key message to uh, everyone and particularly uh, women into business English teaching practice. I totally understand what you mean by that. <laughs> uh, and yes, it's an absolutely tough environment, uh, especially related to what you said as well, considering the context of the, the, the student, right? Uh, there are things that your student will not simply say about their reality, which has to do, for example, with the very last week of the month, which are absolutely concentrated in delivering the result of the sales of the month. <laughs> and for that reason, they may possibly cancel the classes. <laughs> or not show up at all. At all, at all. So, <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, but even send a message. No, he won't. <laughs> they simply won't. Don't expect it. Take it from granted. <laughs> Something, Isabel Carla, your yeah, comments, I, I would like to say something, uh, something really interesting uh, regarding motivation. Sometimes a business English student has to be absent for many reasons. And uh, there's something that I learned how to do that is to make the student not feel bad in case he or she has to cancel a class and try to compensate it uh, somehow. Uh, it can be in the next class or just uh, uh, appreciating the student for letting you know, wishing the student good luck on whatever it is that he is or she is doing. Uh, those little things make a difference because uh, our responsibility as business English teachers uh, is huge. I oh, mean, yeah. we're involved with something that uh, if the student does not perform the way he or she should, he or she might lose their job. Oh, yeah. So, do, do you agree with that? I mean, we have totally. to take every single thing into consideration. And, and that's why I insist that we, we should work together yeah. rather than I'm the boss, I'm in charge of the lesson, here's the thing, if you missed class, you didn't do homework, what are you doing, you know? Definitely. We need to work together. And if you're not willing to understand that your student has crazy schedule, if your student will cancel right before class, if you're not willing to understand that, it's yeah. like, it's not, it's unpredictable. It could be anything. Again, it's a partnership. It's supposed to be together. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any comments? Um, so what Kyla was also saying is that I see sometimes a lot of teachers on um, groups kind of taking it personally, like, oh, the student didn't do the homework. He doesn't care enough about my class. He, you know, like he doesn't value me enough. And it's it's not about you. Like Kari says, uh, the student has a really crazy, hectic schedule. So we have, we need to take that into consideration if we want to be a business English uh, trainer, if we want to work in this segment. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Sabelle. And uh, what I, I guess here, what really changes is the fact that we work in Brazil. Everything is personal in this damn country. <laughs> you know everything oh he talked to me he's in a in a stronger voice whatever you know and this person hates me i i hear this from my students oh the german director doesn't like me uh he never answers my email like only one word or two se two sentences no this person is focused on the work not on you. <laughs> so we take here everything personally. We tend to, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't, I do a lot. It's part of me. But we need to understand that many times it's not personal. It's the work. And it's okay. Your student's not canceling the class because he or she hates you. You never exactly. know what's going on on the other side of the screen. 
and for online classes. Yeah. Another thing you talked about and I found very, very interesting, Karin, has to do with talk about business, right? Uh, and talk about business to people that are business related and always have in mind that we need to be a bit more curious about what people do and what they, because they, they can speak for hours about that. If you just push the right button, <laughs> because that's the, what they, they know a lot. Uh, and if you are just a bit inquisitive and curious about them and you can embrace opportunities like that, I think in many situations, you can talk up to a friend because we are all surrounded by people that are uh, related to the corporate environment. You, you just need to, to, to look around. So you just look around and see, okay, this computer was produced by a company where I possibly know someone that works there. Or maybe this product that has been uh, imported from this country was first negotiated by someone to, to have the price here for the best price. Uh, and sometimes I think that it not only can uh, approach colleagues, we can also approach uh, friends, you can approach uh, uh, family related people in not diverse of situations. It's if it's Christmas or family meeting, you can instead of having one way to dismystify uh, the fact that you are an English teacher to anyone that your family that knows that you do that. Just ask the person, say, how, how has it been about business? And then people say, oh, you've been English teaching English. Yes, I do. So and then if you start asking that person more about her or his job, eventually you're going to find the person understand that your job is not exactly teaching language or teaching English only. Not, not of course, taking it for granted. But little by little, you, you, you start uh, promoting awareness about uh, the job that you do, which is a bit more uh, specific and specialized as well. Yeah. Truly get to know the people, right? Why not? Like, ask questions. I know nothing about taxation in Brazil. It's a mess. I need to ask my students. Please tell me. I have no idea. <laughs> I try. I, I swear to God, I try to understand taxation in Brazil, but I would never understand the same way as my student who works in the field does. But I believe that also this part, whenever they realize, whenever students realize that they don't know how to explain basic concepts about their own job, say, oh, maybe I know how to do this in Portuguese, but I, I have just figured out that I don't know how to explain this in English. And then I have to, it, it changes. The, it's not that the teacher doesn't know. It's that the, the student realized that he doesn't know how to deliver basic concepts about his own job. So. And then self-awareness, right? Exactly. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, Karin, thank you very much. We're watching the time here. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we could talk for hours about uh, the job we love the most. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Sure. Thank you so very much for inviting me uh, for participating today. Um, I know it can be tough at times and too honest. You're amazing. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, um, I believe that we should be um, open and that's how people are going to be better prepared to go into business English classes and I highly recommend that if you're not a BSIG member yet do it because um, you need people around you who will help you if you're in debt so once again thank you so much it's been my honor and my pleasure to talk to you today thank, thank you Karen much. Here on. So uh, we are moving uh, forward, watching the time. We are a bit uh, running a bit late, we know. And forgive us, uh, YouTube uh, participants. We need you to move on with our uh, schedule. And now I'd like, please, Carla, to introduce and present our very next uh, speaker of the day, please. <laughs> course. Let me do that. I'm sharing my screen here. All right. So everybody who's here with us, right now I'm going to introduce Celiana Kobayashi. She's going to be talking about English language testing in business context.
And uh, Eliana, she's amazing. You're going to love her talk. She has recently concluded her postdoctoral research at UFISCAR, and she's a professor at Federal Institute of Education, Science and Technology of Sao Paulo. She has a master and doctoral degrees in applied linguistics from Unicampi. She has published papers on topics like uh, English language testing in business context, multiliteracies and English teaching, self-assessment in English teaching, English proficiency levels and teachers' education, among others. She has also conducted research on washback effect and language assessment for University of Cambridge. Her research fields are language assessment and washback effect. And uh, we are about to begin the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen with you. Eliana, feel free to share your screen with us. And I'm going to unmute her so that she can talk and you guys can listen. Ricardo, are you able to unmute her? One second, please. Of course. Good afternoon. Hello, Eliana. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, let me see. Let me try to share my screen. Amazing. Yes, we can see your screen. Let me try to. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to mute myself and you can go on. I had some problems with my camera. I don't know if I can connect my cell phone in just a moment. Okay, no problem. As soon as you connect your phone, we're going to see it here and enable it for you. Okay. Do we need to allow re uh, record audio from the cell phone? Yes. Okay. I don't know if you can see me. Let me see if you show up here. Ricardo, can you see her here? Okay, I can see her in the list using two uh, users and both are here as panelists. Just... Okay. Mm 
my camera is off. Do I need to allow it or you're going to allow Yes, me? you need to allow it. And then we'll be mm -hmm. able to see you. I cannot uh, turn it on. That's okay. If if you're unable to turn it on, we can move on without the camera. Yes. It's a pity. Let me try. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, I don't know if you can do it or if I have to do it. Uh, no, no, actually, you have to do. But we can move on with the presentation with the slides only. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Carla, for inviting me to take part in this event. My presentation is about language testing in business context. In the job market, English language is considered an essential requirement to find the position. Nowadays, we can realize how English has become important to get a job. Although it seems to become a knowledge, a little do we know about how the language assessment process occurs in companies, because it's their decision, it's the company's decision to choose their testing tools. So there are some possibilities. Uh, they can require English test certificates, buy their own tests or conduct their own interviews, hire a company to assess the applicants. So the question is, how can we help students prepare for English tests in selection process? In order to do that, it's very important to discuss what language testing involves. There are several aspects, dimensions, and fundamental considerations in language testing. I've bought three of them, as they are connected to language teaching and to each other. Kinds of tests, language for a specific purpose tests, and washback of language tests. There are four types of tests according to Hughes. The placement tests, that provides information to place students at the stage of the teaching program appropriate to their abilities. We usually see them in language schools when a new student joining the program. Diagnostic tests identify students' strengths and weakness. It's used to see what teaching is necessary. Achievement tests that are related to language courses. They check how successful students have been and are based on content and course objectives. Achievement tests are those tests we usually apply in class. Proficient tests are related to language core, sorry, proficient tests measure people's ability in language regardless of any training. There is connection between this kind of test and language program applicants have studied. So there, sorry, there is no connection. So it's different from achievement tests because they are based on specifications of what applicants are able to do in the language. So proficient tests are the tests that uh, job applicants are supposed to take in selection process. Therefore, in class, students do achievement tests. In selection process, the applicants take proficient tests. Examples of proficient tests used in business, con business context is the test of English for International Communication, the TOEIC, that's very popular in Brazil, and the business language testing service, Bullets, that's also uh, very popular in the country. So if we compare achievement tests and proficient tests, it's possible to see that achievement tests are based on syllabus, books, and other materials. 
while proficient tests are based on a set of specifications. Achievement tests, I can say that's about the past, as they analyze if students have understood what they have studied. While in proficient tests, they want to predict if applicants will be able to use the language in a given situation. For instance, in a job, if they are accepted in university, if it, they will, will be able to understand instructions, etc. So achievement tests are used in language courses, while proficiency tests are used by future employers, universities, and the test takers, if they want to know which level they are. So if the point here is to prepare students to take proficiency tests, we can ask the questions, can achievement tests be similar to proficiency tests? So can we prepare our students to take proficiency tests? So if achievement tests are based on course objectives, they are getting similar to proficiency tests. If such course objectives are similar to the language specifications of the proficiency test, and if the test writer creates achievement tests which reflect these objectives. So, how is the test likely to be applied in a business context? I believe it should be language for specific purpose tests, according to Douglas, Kai, and Kunam. Because these kinds of tests involve language for academic purpose and occupational or professional purpose. They are different from general purpose tests for two main reasons. Because language performance vary with context and tests test task. So language ability and knowledge of the field interact with the test content, giving it giving more authenticity to the test. Language for specific purpose is precise because technical language is peculiar to the field. Here we can see. Uh, Test content and test methods, they derive from analysis of a specific purpose target language use situation. And there is interaction between test takers language ability, specific purpose content knowledge and the task. So it's possible to make inference about the takers ability to use the language in the specific domain. And when there is much concern about being approved in tests like the selection process, we can usually identify washback effect. And what is washback? The definitions here are from two seminal papers, one from Messick and the other from Alderson and Wall. So according to Messick, washback refers to extent to which the introduction and use of a test influenced language, teachers and learners to do things they would not do otherwise that promote or inhibit language learning. So teaching and learning change because of the tests, similar to what Alderson and Wall claim that washback refers to the influence of testing on teaching and learning. Washback is a complex phenomenon, okay? There are dimensions of the washback like intentionality, specificity, intensity, and value according to Watanabe. Now I'm gonna talk just about value that can be negative and positive. Negative washback would be test examples. That would be test wisely, 
Instead of studying the language, students and teachers may resort to techniques to increase the performance in the test, not exactly studying the language and teaching the language. Teaching and learning towards the test without understanding its rational or aims. Memorization approach, anxiety and pressure. So, we can come to the conclusion that tests are important to people's lives, okay? So how can we promote positive washback of the test? It's more probable to happen when participants understand the purpose and the intended results of the test. Participants have a positive, positive attitude and behavior towards the test. The test measures what the program intends to teach. So there is no difference between studying the language in class and how students are gonna be tested. And the test is based on sound theoretical principles. So we have a testing foundation. And the test uses authentic texts and tasks. This is according to Bailey and Hughes. So I believe that students can benefit from proficiency language tests in classroom as long as teaching, program, course objectives, and other aspects that we have discussed in the presentation are aligned with the tests. Some reference. So thank you for this presentation. And um, I don't know if it, there are questions about it. You can feel free to unshare the, the, the file if you want to. Uh -huh. uh, I would like to ask a few questions about okay. uh, English language testing. Uh, how frequent do you think it is for companies to demand a proficiency certificate, for instance? Do you think it happens in the Brazilian context? Is it happening more and more? Hi, Eliana, could you hear me? We might be having technical issues. Yeah, let's try again. Eliana, can you hear us? Apparently she has left the Zoom meeting. Maybe she's going to... Oh, I can see her now. That's amazing. Yeah. Eliana, no, no, we can see, but we cannot hear you. cannot hear you. Maybe the microphone is. We cannot hear you yet. Yeah, definitely not. Now you're connecting to audio. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, now we can. Yes, I using this cell. Okay. Um, about now, uh, just a second, because we can hear you twice. Um, from the cell phone now and from the computer. Okay, go on. Okay. Yes. You were asking about certificates. I think that it's very common. Okay. Uh, because, uh, for instance, the companies ask for TOEIC or bullets, and I have already uh, helped some students to get prepared. Amazing. And I believe that maybe it's going to get more common uh, because it's a way for the companies to understand exactly the level that uh, the applicants have. 
definitely because, because what I instance, uh, go on go on sorry because for instance when you say ah my level is advanced what does it mean to be advanced yeah. what kind of a specification as we said about specifications Efficiency tests have set of specifications. <clears throat> so, what kind of skills do you really have? So, that's the question. Yeah. And when you use the standardized tests, international tests, they provide a, a whole description yeah, of what you can do using the language. <clears throat> Perfect. Ricardo, Isabel, do you have any questions? How? Oh, yes, I do have a question, uh, Eliana. How uh, how would you describe the the reaction from the approach uh, on the the idea and the concept of uh, assessing uh, English language, particularly for uh, a business uh, setting. Sorry, I don't know if I could understand everything because it was a little bit difficult to hear. Sorry, could you repeat okay. please, the question? Sure, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> my question is to do with how companies, uh, from your perspective, how companies reacted, usually react uh, from the, the idea and the concept of assessing uh, English uh, communication skills in a business environment. And we have another mm -hmm. question from Evan later. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that they are, uh, as I have to, uh, said to Carla, I think that they are getting used. Maybe it's a little bit complicated to understand exactly their language of view. Um, why? Because sometimes uh, it's difficult for professionals, for professionals that are not in language field to understand how to assess, yes? To understand criteria, to understand specification. Sometimes they can have like a language view totally focused on grammar, yes? Or they're totally focused on speaking. So it's hard if you don't belong to language field to deal with language and especially to language testing. That's why a lot of them, they hire schools, hire companies specialized in language in order to assess the applicants. This is very common as well. Because and sometimes they can describe Sorry, or they can describe the tasks that are they are supposed to perform, the applicants are supposed to perform what the language expert and the language specialist will have to do. Try to see what kind of language, the foreign language, are they gonna, uh, the, the applicants are supposed to have to perform the task. You know what I mean? Because there is the content, the knowledge fields, and the, uh, sorry, the field uh, that you need to know. So there is this knowledge, the technical knowledge, and you understand language that's necessary to perform this task. So you have a field and you have a language that needs to be combined. I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Allow me to present a question coming from Evan Frando. He's asking if you uh, think it's possible to test business English as a lingua franca or BELF? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that is for a specific purpose, uh, but I don't know if we can consider lingua franca so far. Yes. Although a lot of people around the world are communicating and business English is important. Uh, I don't know if you maybe in the future like right now probably not okay uh carlo isabel any questions any additional questions let me just check if 
There's a question uh, here on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, Eliana, please. is there a test which is commonly uh, required or more frequently re required by companies? I think the, I think TOIC, TOIC is very popular. Having TOIC certificates nowadays, if you are applying for jobs in companies, I think that is important to have. Okay. Or is that least important to know a little uh, how the test works in case you need to take it? Yes. Uh, okay. Bullets is also very popular. Bullets is also uh, uh, focused on business environment, uh, business communication. I think Perfect. both of Thank them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Amazing. I don't know if we have any more questions. Okay, just checking if anyone else has uh, additional questions. Uh, we are watching uh, our time as well. Uh, any any extra comment, uh, Eliana, from you to our Business English Special Interest Group board mm. or for the participants? Mm. Any advice you would uh, give for us? Uh, I think that uh, testing, talking about testing nowadays, especially business testing, uh, I don't think that it's very usual. I mean, in schools or teachers, I don't think that uh, in curriculum, I don't think that uh, business English and tests, they are together, yes? You have business English courses, but I don't know if people are giving uh, attention to business English tests or to tests in business settings, yes? So I think that maybe more studies should be developed, yes. In terms of uh, research, I think that uh, assessment, assessment in foreign language is very, I mean, is increasing. Because if you see, uh, I mean, test is everywhere, yes. Test is everywhere. On the moment that you want to take a course, when you want to apply for a position, Tests, they are everywhere. So I think that maybe it should be more studied. It should be more uh, explored in teaching. And uh, also students should pay more attention to this because sooner or later, you're gonna have to do a test in an English. And I'll, I, I don't even say that it's business English, but uh, English tests, because some companies, they are not so, I mean, uh, demanding in like business English tests, but some, they are demanding having a certificate in English. Yes? Maybe the general English, but this is necessary. And I think that we should pay more attention to this. We just, have just one more question. Do I we have time? to do that ahead. Do, I think so. All right. So what benefits could test preparation bring to business English students who are already using English at, at their company as they go through prep? Okay. So um, sometimes um, Students, either, students and sometimes teachers, they don't have like a, like a good image of preparation because there, there seems to be a distance between preparation and the learning. And I don't agree with that. I think that if the test is well designed, if the test is good, it's authentic, it's based on authentic test. Preparation means learning the language, is studying the language. It's not test wiseness. So if you're preparing for a test, you are studying the language. Yes, for me, there is no distance. Uh, provided that that test is a good test. Okay, so I think that preparation is good because you are studying the language, you're learning. And also, 
you you said something about if the students they are already working okay they are working but sometimes language use is very peculiar to that company yes as we said technical language and peculiar to that company sometimes the other companies they have other kinds of language approach yes so the test tries to cover it all yes for instance a good test if in business setting would cover like uh, meetings, presentations, uh, calls, uh, etc. So maybe it's nice because the student would be prepared for common situations in English in a business setting. While you're just working, maybe, I don't know, it depends on, on the job, but maybe it's gonna be, you know, um, not that it's going to be uh, narrowed, but, but maybe it's going to be just for some situations that the students are used to do in the company. Yes. I don't know if I was clear. Why yes, on a test there is, why on a test there is a wide range of situations in the use of the language. Thank you very much. Okay. It was pretty clear to me. Thank you, Eliana. You're welcome. Eliana, thank you very much for your time, your attention, and your contribution to our very first uh, Business English Special Interest Group event uh, after close to uh, two years. So we are uh, connecting our community of business English teachers uh, so we can have more uh, professionals in the field sharing knowledge uh, about this important teaching practice and it has been a pleasure to have you here today it's a Saturday uh, afternoon and uh, we are really glad for your contribution today thank you very much thank you Okay, so we are moving on with our schedule, uh, but first, okay, we know that for our uh, of, uh, Business English uh, event, maybe too much, <laughs> we are going for a five minute break, so consider having some water, bring some snack, because in five minutes we are back with the Rusty Soul Basic Board, we're going to talk a bit about our purpose and our mission as a SIG and share a bit about our lessons uh, we have learned uh, so far. So stay, don't go away. Uh, we are back in five minutes. Thanks a lot for your attention and see you soon. At 4.03, right? Back at 4.03. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Ricardo, Evan here. I'll watch from YouTube, okay? I'll get okay, out of this. Thank you very much, Evan. Okay, thanks, thanks Ricardo. See you later. Good luck. You're welcome. Thanks a lot for your time.
Okay. We're about to get back to our very end of the Brastiso Business English Special Interest Group presentation of the day. Just waiting for a few minutes, a bit more, until we have Isabel back. All right. Great. We are all back and set. And the go of this very next and last talk of the day is to talk a bit uh, about the Business English Special Interest Group purpose and mission. You may, for you, that has just uh, started following uh, our page. It's important to mention that the Brasilis of this SIG is not exactly a new uh, SIG. It already existed for a few years, but uh, in this year, 2020, uh, we have decided to, to have the special interest group back on track because we believe it's important to connect with the business English teaching community and, well, we're going to talk a bit more about this in a few uh, seconds. But first, uh, I think it's important uh, for you that is following uh, our channel and watching this presentation to get to know who we are. So briefly presenting the Rusty Soul Business English uh, SIG board. We are, uh, this is me, my name is Ricardo Bruns. We also uh, have uh, Carla Delia and Isabel Badre, Marcella Harrisberger and Alini and Pedro are not here with us today, uh, but they are part of the, the board supporting uh, our SIG. And of course, we are talking to you and we are willing to identify uh, possible members that can support uh, our mission. And we are here to talk about what's our purpose as a special interest group. Okay. So before I present uh, myself, I will ask please uh, uh, Isabel and Carla to present uh, themselves. Uh, maybe we can go uh, alphabetical order sure. here. So Carla, <laughs> please. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Uh, you have seen me during the presentation. My name is Carla Delia. Uh, you may know me on the internet and social media as a Save Me teacher. I've been teaching English for around 20 years. I'm not going to say the date exactly. And uh, I've been a business English teacher for over 10 years. Um, I started, when I started teaching business English, that was not what I wanted to do. It was by accident. So I went from accidentally teaching business English in companies in Sao Paulo to uh, loving it and uh, qualifying myself and studying and learning how to become a better business English teacher. And from that point, I became a company and currently I own uh, a, an online school called Espresso Idiomas and we teach 100% online. Most of our students are professionals. Uh, they are not necessarily uh, corporate professionals, but they do have a profession and they need English for their jobs and their lives. Uh, if I could share one lesson I've learned, 
something that I learned and that I hold uh, near to my heart, near my heart is that we will never know everything there is about business English. Uh, we will never know everything about our students' business, but if we do want to get to know business English teaching and our students better, we're in for a treat. It's just an amazing world and you get to know about so many uh, amazing things. In addition to that, uh, I do what I do because I know it makes a difference in my students' lives. Basically, that's me. <laughs> well, this I forgot something. I didn't speak about my qualifications. As I said, I decided to qualify myself in uh, business English teaching. So I hold a master's degree in applied linguistics. And my research was about business English teaching. Okay, thank you Isabel, very much. Wonderful, Isabel. Uh, well, my name is Isabel Badra. Um, I've been teaching for almost four years, uh, nonstop. And I say that because I did have um, other experience teaching when I was much younger. And it didn't go quite well because like Karin was mentioning in her talk, I was kind of thrown into like in company classes with no teaching experience and definitely no business English experience. So I obviously didn't like it. So yes. <laughs> but then I came back into teaching um, almost four years ago, and that's when I started learning how to do things. And for that, I, I, I went into the CELTA, so I have a CELTA, and also I hold the CP, and I have a business, um, a bachelor's degree in business administration. Um I got into business English in 2018, kind of like with Kyla, kind of like by accident. Um, as in, I got into it and I thought, okay, I can do this, uh, really do this instead of having one or other business English student. And a lesson learned is that it's, it's, it's different from general English in the sense that you are not talking about business, but you're, you have to teach your students how to communicate better in order to do their jobs. So they don't necessarily have to know everything. They don't have to know all of the vocabulary related to, I don't know, appliances or art or gardening. Um, they need to know sufficiently to do their jobs well. So I guess that that was one of the lessons that I learned. And when I learned that, it definitely took off uh, like a big weight off my shoulders. Um, also, I think it's a little connected with this is that we are not the holder of all knowledge. It's shared knowledge between you and your student. And when you realize that, and when you realize which, what a rich resource your student is, whew, you know, it's... It's amazing. So those were more than one lesson learned, but very valuable <laughs> lessons. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Well, briefly presenting uh, myself, my name is Ricardo Bruns. I've been working as a business English teacher and trainer and teacher training. Uh, Teacher training is something what more recent, but as a teacher in business English for the last 10 years. However, I've been in contact with business English for over 20 years, and that has to do with the fact that before uh, getting back to English teaching, I used to work in a corporate scenario. And it was in this corporate scenario, I learned a lot about the importance of business English. Before, jump, before working in this corporate scenario, I used to be a very young English teacher, general English teacher, being 17 years old. And when I started working in a corporate scenario, I realized very, very quickly that the language knowledge I had, even though I was considered advanced at that time, I realized that the language knowledge I had at that time wasn't enough to communicate properly in a business setting. Had to start learning everything from scratch, 
And it was only possible, I think, because I had, let's say, what it takes to when we call uh, uh, being able to to uh, learn from my, uh, using uh, finding my own uh, resources uh, and being autonomous to so I have, let's say, a rich uh, learning autonomy. However, although working in a corporate scenario, I had a lot of opportunities to communicate and have opportunities to uh, put my English communication skills in practice. I also realized I was surrounded by people and colleagues that although they were studying English, uh, they were not exactly studying English for uh, to do their jobs. It's like uh, Isabel and Carla has just mentioned, and also uh, 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 Evan and also Karin mentioned along the the, the, court, the this presentation. And I realized it was possible to to do something to support people to communicate better uh, for their jobs. For one reason, I I was still in love with the language. I wanted to go back to teaching, but now with a different purpose. So. I started looking for business English teaching classes. Uh, the last 10 years has been uh, history and it has been just fascinating because I moved from a completely technical area to a completely uh, more uh, human approach uh, uh, scenario. And, and this has been just fascinating. And connecting this, uh, this is a usual path, I believe, uh, business English teachers first, just like Evan mentioned in, in the very beginning, uh, uh, they start working as uh, for a school that may work as an agency and that will send you to teach at this company or that company. But eventually you realize you can start working by yourself and you become a freelancer and you start promoting yourself. But when you move to this point, you, if you're not working for any school and you're just working for yourself, you eventually realize that you are kind of alone. And you need, in addition to maintain yourself as a teacher, you need to do a lot of job to connect with other professionals and build a, a, a healthy network of professionals that do what, you, what we do. And for that reason, in the very beginning of this year, I told myself, okay, 10 years in this field has been fun, has been amazing. I've been learning a lot. It's just fantastic. But I want to connect with people that do what I do. And the Brastiso Business English SIG shares this idea of connecting with people that belongs to this area. We are aware that we have hundreds or maybe thousands, or we don't know exactly how many and who we are as business English teachers in Brazil. And we believe that it's essential to connect with this huge community, invisible community, so to speak, and start from today, something that can be somehow visionary or maybe a sort of a dream, uh, which is a way to having ourselves supporting each other as freelancers uh, or connecting to uh, uh, other companies or schools that do what we do. And little by little, we can support our students to communicate better for their jobs, uh, considering business English teaching uh, practice. So moving on with our presentation, I'd like to share uh, what are uh, our, what is our purpose as a business English special inter interest group. Uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. One second, please. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Great. Amazing. So, as uh, mentioned before, our goal, our mission uh, as a SIG. So, as a business English special interest group, BISIG, we aim to promote a sense of a supporting community in a way we can. What? Identify here and understand who we are and where we stand as business English professionals. So, okay, just to, just to 
before we move on with this following slides, what we want to do here is to share our mission and also interact with every single person who is watching our presentation right now and promote a discussion on this, okay? We would seriously like to hear from you right now uh, your thoughts about what we are going to present right now, because we are going to be sharing what we feel about that. And it's going to be essential for to hear from you guys as well, okay? What we mean by that, so who we are and where we stand as business English professionals has to do with, we know that uh, somewhere or, or somehow we are or professionals who are considering to start teaching business English, uh, or we are professionals who have maybe just started into business English teaching, or maybe we are also professionals who are experienced in the field and has been teaching business English for ages, but we don't know you. And we want to know, we want to get to know you. And this is going to be connected with the following uh, practices as well. So far, so good. Uh, Carlo Isabel, would you like to share something about it? I think something interesting is that when I started teaching business English, I didn't, didn't even know what business English was. So maybe you are here flirting with the idea of becoming a business English teacher and uh, you're welcome and you should be a part of our community too. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. Um, like Carla, when I started as well, uh, not that long ago, I thought that business English was speaking businessy terms and teaching that. Um, but it's much more than that. And if I had somewhere to go, as in we have this B sick today, it would have been much easier. I think the road is pretty lonely. And it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Totally agree. We share exactly the very same thoughts. Uh, by the way, if this is English teaching is more about hearing than speaking. Uh, moving on, we need to identify here and understand our needs as professionals and as a community as well. Uh, we have zero clues so far about what we need as, uh, as professionals. Because we, again, considering the first bullet point, we don't know who we are. So, okay, understanding who we are is going to take time. Yes, it will. But as this process goes on, it moves little by little, we are going to understand what are our needs as a community and as, a, as professionals as well, okay? We are speaking of that uh, and inviting you as well to follow our content, which is available in all three uh, most common social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and also LinkedIn. Okay, we all have uh, three pages in this channel. So considering following us in all of them or the, the, the social media platform you prefer the most. Okay, so we're going to keep this channel to interact with the community. And I can anticipate one thing as well. We are about to build a group which is going to happen on Facebook where in this group, we are willing to welcome any single professional in the field to exchange ideas and share doubts you may possibly have. So stay tuned for our social media channels where we are going to launch this group where any single professional in the field is going to be welcome to be supported whenever you find any, any questions. Like, I have this student, I don't know exactly how to deal with this situation. Someone is going to be there to, to support you, trust us, okay? And I think, uh, uh, Ricardo, if please. I may interrupt you, this is, has course. already started happening. Here in the comments, they're exchanging uh, suggestions and recommendations of possible books uh business books educational materials so it's i'm really happy to see that happening already and in the facebook community facebook group it's going to be amazing absolutely that's essential i can see from the the chat uh we have on, on on facebook here as well so yes the idea is exactly this you are not alone okay you've been teaching business english and if you are anyhow 
insecure about, about your teaching practice, trust us. We are about to offer you a place, a safe place, where we can interact, get to know each other, and support each other as well. Okay, it doesn't have to be like just no. You, you have to walk the whole thing, the the whole path uh, by yourself. No, this is not necessary. Okay. Uh, so far, is there any comment here? Um, I was just, I'm going to write our Instagram handle here on the comments so people can follow us. Please. Absolutely. I have shared before the links for, uh, for our community, but please, if you don't mind sharing, yes. Very good. So moving on, we need to identify here and understand as well. Uh, the needs of business English teaching, considering our local scenario and conditions. Uh, along this talk, we had Karin talking about our local needs. We have a very specific uh, market conditions. We know exactly how our clients like to negotiate prices and many other things as well. This tells a lot about our local needs. It's essential though to think globally, but acting locally is fundamental. So understanding how we behave, how our client, how our market uh, chains and operates is just essential. And discussing all this in a platform where we can exchange about ideas about that is going to be just fantastic. So we can learn from each other how, how you've been doing your, your job and you can support each other in this practice as well. There's a, there's a comment here, Evan said, not only support network, as people get to know each other, they pass work on to each other. And uh, in a big city like Sao Paulo, if people are teaching in company, there are many times I remember uh, I used to get like uh, uh, possible clients in regions in Sao Paulo in which I couldn't go to <laughs> because they were too far from me. So I wish I had a community and uh, to which I could share this information with which I could share this information. So it's good for business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Our day has only 24 hours and there. Uh, and if you just overflow yourself with a bunch of students, you just burn out option. Mm -hmm. Yeah uh or you, you you need to to start sharing with people that you that you trust and if you don't know even who you can count on so that means we need a community to support mm -hmm. each other as well so uh also considering that we need to identify here and understand the needs of the market we operate and how we can support our clients and students or something i believe itself uh, is important we talked about flexibility in our job uh, as business English teachers uh, today. And this includes the fact that we don't need to operate only as business English teachers, okay? You may support, for example, an HR department to hire professionals that need to communicate in a more uh, uh, advanced level or a more adequate level. We cannot simply, for example, I'm just mentioning one example, okay? You cannot take from granted that HR departments are ready uh, to to hire professionals that need to communicate in English for their own uh, environment. We can have we can share this knowledge with them. We can provide our services in a completely different manner. Business English teachers, the more the more they identify themselves as solution providers, the better they diverse their range of operating in the market. And in order to do so, we have to listen very, very carefully to our marketing conditions. So it's all about paying close attention to what the client is looking for. Sometimes they don't even mention, but we have to pay attention. We have to observe that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. It's like when students come to us, uh, well, clients come to, directly to us and say, oh, I need to improve my English. Uh, I need, to, I have gaps in my grammar knowledge that I need to improve. 
And then you're like, okay. And then you start talking to them and they're like, yeah, the thing is when I write emails, I don't know how to write this. When I write a report, I don't know how to write this. So it's not necessarily about the grammar, but what he needs for his job. And we yeah. need to, to be able to ask the questions and not just take it, okay, you need to improve your grammar. All right, let's work with this. And as a business yeah. English teacher, you can specialize as well. I mean, you can uh, offer your services uh, as a trainer for job interviews, for instance. Mm -hmm. You can specialize within the area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I do believe we have plain conditions to listen very, very carefully to what your clients need uh, and identify how you can support and how you can help uh, than in a huge variety of situations. Just pay close attention to what they actually need and present yourself as a solution provider. Of course, we will have, we cannot cover how to do this right now, but this is only one suggestion. Okay. Moving on to our following list of our mission, we aim also to gather and connect. Connect business English ten centers, solution providers, and professionals across the country. Okay, We are not only uh, teachers, we can connect ourselves to companies who are providing uh, business English teaching solutions, Okay, uh, and also solution providers in many different areas. So the idea is to have in this group of business English, not only teachers, but companies who are already pr supporting people to communicate better in English. That's all the, the main thing about business English. Any comments here? Or can we I move think, on? I think, uh, I think the idea is that we are part of uh bigger world, the matrix that cannot be disconnected. Like it's the business English teacher, it's the client, it's the companies. It's also other education companies who uh, that provide solutions and that all can be interconnected and we can help each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're part of a bigger thing. <laughs> I think sometimes we, we stay within our bubble, our English, our ELT bubble. And I think it's important to uh, look abroad and, and make connections. Exactly. Absolutely. Also, we do believe it's important to gather and connect other Rusty's or six, because we are many, uh, and sharing and learning from each other. Uh, the Rusty's or uh, community, okay? If you are not yet, by the way, a uh, member of the Brass Tissel, do yourself a favor, consider registering because it costs only 15 years per month, okay? And we offer more than 16 different SIGs so you can interact and learn a lot from them. Uh, for only 15 years, it's absolutely cheap. Uh, so our goal is to connect our community with other SIGs so we can learn from them as well and say, how this six can under, uh, help us understanding what happens in our uh, uh, environment. Uh, it's again, it's going beyond our own bubble and, and hearing and understanding and thinking differently from uh, professionals in different areas as well. Or of course, connecting with international B6. Today we had uh, a sample of that inviting uh, Evan Frando, which is the a joint co coordinator of the IATF of uh, and also connecting with related communities uh, and also the other business English professionals, being uh, book authors or professionals who are connected to uh, intercultural communication for business. Again, we insist it's going beyond the teaching field. As long as it has to do with communication in English, we can go way beyond a teaching community. Also gathering and connecting academic researchers in the local business English field. Today we also had a sample of that. We invited Eliana because we know that our professionals who do research, they carry on research 
on business English uh, practice. And it's we need to, to get to know these people and the job they've been doing so we can share to our teaching community. So we may not necessarily belong to the academic uh, field, but connecting with them and hearing how, of their perspective and their impressions about the business English uh, field is crucial because then we have, we connect a bridge, we build a bridge between these uh, three areas. We have the academic telling the teaching field what's happening in, in the business field. And, and uh, something really, oops. <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, something really uh, interesting and that speaks to me when I was uh, going through my master's degree and my master's degree research, I felt very uh, isolated from the community. I was researching, I had uh, some very interesting good points and conclusions and data, but I could only uh, share them with the academic community. Felt It was so hard to uh, get in touch with business English professionals that would profit so much from what I had been researching. So I think this bridge has got to happen. We have got a lot to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And like Evan said in his presentation, going forward, we should aim to base our our teaching on research rather than on our intuition, right? Exactly. Great point. Whatever it is that is on your mind right now as a business English teacher, I must guarantee that some research, some researcher has already done some research on it. So uh, there's help there. There's information, instruction. Absolutely. Which brings us to the next point, which has to do with gathering connect uh, books and resource publishers in business English teaching practice. Uh, early today, uh, Evan presented us with a huge collection of materials we can access related to business English teaching practice that can support us in our, in our practice. Uh, we believe it's fundamental to connect uh, publishers in, in these areas and have them presenting these materials and saying how they can be used, how can be, they can be resourceful. Okay. Uh, and this goes beyond the, the internet, but uh, uh, physical uh, materials say, okay, where can we go? We were talk I see in the, the chat, we were talking about resources, materials like, for example, business result or this or that. We believe this kind of discussion is essential and having the publishers presenting their own materials on how we can better use this kind of resources is just fantastic. Okay. And last but not least in this term, gathering and connecting external stakeholders, including HR associations and relevant professionals. Okay, uh, so along this uh, afternoon, we talked about how the reality of a business English uh, teacher may be a bit distant for uh, the company. So remember, Evan, we were talking about this with Evan, how much uh, effort we need to convince companies that they need uh, support to communicate better. And that means business English teaching classes, training, whatever you name it. But connecting these associations, connecting these professionals and promoting awareness about proper business English teaching practices and, and so on and so forth is going to be more than uh, important because not only we can share uh, our point of view, but we can also hear from them. And then again, connecting, building bridges between this field as well. Amazing. Just moving on here. Our last list of mission uh, as a SIG includes supporting and engage and supporting and engaging professionals, business English professionals in different careers uh, estates. We talked that uh, in the beginning. So if you are a professional willing to get into business English teaching, okay, we're here to support you as well. If you're a professional who is in the field but needs support, okay, we, we're here for that as well. So again, the group, is going to be there for you. 
uh, and of course uh, supporting professionals who are uh, in a more advanced stages uh, in uh, in business English and have professionals supporting each other. So this is not something that comes, it's not, does not come necessarily only from the basic, no, the community support uh, each other. Also support and engage professionals into sharing best practices in our, in our community. Again, we want to hear from you. How have you been doing your job? And, and what do you think is important to share? What would you like to share uh, to a whole business English teaching community that you truly believe it's important? And we, also, we are here as well to encourage you to say, we want to hear you. We've be, you've been doing your job by yourself for years, or you are willing to do that, and you have something to share. We are opening this uh, space, this safe place uh, for you. Any comments here, girls? I just want to say that it goes to show, we have a, a comment here. Uh, we could start a business English book club, book club with monthly meetings. So it's here in the chat. So this kind of comment just goes to show that people really want this business English community and I think are ready for it. So I yeah. think this is very exciting. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, Luciana. We totally agree with you. So we, as we consider a study group in, in the field, which may focus, for example, on books and resources, say, let's dive in this chapter from this book that talks about this, which is important as well. Okay, yes, that's exactly the, the, the idea. You see that we are sharing all this mission, and I want you to state very, very clear that I told you in the beginning of this talk, it's something that has to do with a dream, with a concept, with something a bit more visionary. I don't truly believe we are going to do this only with six members, okay? It's something bigger and we will need support to do it so. So if you identify yourself with at least one of these topics and you say, tell yourself, yes, I can contribute, I can support the BSIG in at least one of these bullet points from the mission statement, Join us, get in touch. We will provide you uh, all the contact uh, information, including all the ones you're seeing from the social media links. Uh, we are going to, we have already provided, but uh, in this meantime, uh, Isabel, Carla, would you mind sharing again the links for our, our social media, please? Absolutely. Yes, of course. Moving on, supporting and engaging professionals into business English teaching. If you are a general English teacher and you are anyhow curious about getting into business English uh, uh, teaching, then yes, we are here for you as well. We are here to, to support you into that and uh, provide you with the, the resources. This entire afternoon was exactly about that. Evan presenting the word of business English Karen presenting what it takes to be a business English uh, teacher with an absolutely honest talk on that. And Eliana providing uh, topics on how uh, business English can be assessed in a corporate setting. Uh, so the idea is exactly this. And last but not least in supporting and engage, uh, supporting and engage teachers on CPD in the business English field, because it is a thing, it's a reality. I recall that along the, the YouTube chat, live chat, somebody mentioned the CERT IBAT, uh, and I can tell from my experience, it's an amazing uh, course. I can say that CERT IBAT is more like a CELTA for business English. Evan also mentioned the, the FTB, which is a test in uh, business English. Uh, which is a very good uh, start into business English uh, CPD as well. So only two references uh, into business English uh, CPD as well. And, uh, and of course, uh, having a network of experienced professionals means that little by little, we're gonna have more and more professionals sharing experiences and training to specialize professionals into this field. This is our goal here as well. Okay. And we want to make use of this time we still have, uh, because in theory we still have more 15 minutes 
uh, for today. I know this quite long. We've been talking about business English today since one in the morning. So thank you very much <laughs> for your time and attention. And uh, also consider that early in the morning, since nine in the morning, the ESP teaching group was also presenting. So, so it has been an entire day focused on adult English teaching practices. Consider watching the ESP uh, SIG recording as well. Uh, Isabel, Carla, would you like to comment anything so far? Uh, well, uh, I think this is going to, first of all, I, I'm, I'm very happy with this event as part of the board and I can say that you are, you all are too. Um, but I'm very happy that we we can start this community going. And because Ricardo and I have shared a lot over the past year, and it's certainly very enriching to share experiences and hear about other people's experiences. So I'm very excited for this new community. Yes, yeah, so am I, as I have, as I had said before, uh, being a business English teacher in the past was a very lonely process for me. And uh, just knowing that there, there can be a community and the experiences can be shared because uh, there's no right or wrong, actually. There's sharing, there's studying, investigating, and helping each other. So I'm just absolutely happy to have been here and to count on so many people being with us. Uh, I have learned a lot today, and this is a lesson that I would like to share with all of you guys and girls. Uh, doesn't matter how long you have been in the market, there's always a lot to be learned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you always have something to contribute, right? Definitely. Different perspectives, different experiences. Absolutely, absolutely. And also make use of this remaining time we have to ask the live chat participants uh, if you have any questions about our purpose and anything related to the whole uh, session we have today, uh, please help yourself to ask uh, in the chat box. Uh, well, thank you very much, Rob Howard. And it, by the way, I cannot simply, uh, it's impossible to end this whole afternoon without saying, Rob, thank you very much for trusting us the responsibility of carrying out the Rusty Soul Business English SIG. Uh, and this includes carrying as well, because both uh, used to belong uh, the the Rusty Soul Business English SIG. We only wanted to have the whole uh, journey to, to continue so we could uh, start supporting the, the community in a different way. Uh, and this as well as includes saying thank you very much to one more person, which is Natalia Guerrero, which uh, is the vice president of the, the Brass Tissot, and was also one more person who uh, trusted us the responsibility of having the, the basic back on track. So Rob and Natalia, thank you very much. And we are here to, to, to hear questions. So. Help yourself. Let's make use of this time we have in a Saturday afternoon. In a very rainy and cold, well, if yeah, you're in exactly. Paul. So perfect for staying here. home and watching for business English talking practice. Exactly. <laughs> Good. Okay, very well. Uh, Carl and Isabel, any additional comments before we move on to wrap up the, the the whole afternoon i i'd love to say that uh i i feel really honored to be part uh, of the board of the business english sig uh it's a challenge for me and i love challenges it's really good to be reconnected with the business english community and uh, because the business English community for me 
has been the teachers that work with me, but now it's going to be even bigger. So I just feel honored and flattered to have been invited and to be part of all of that. Thank you very much, Carla. Yes, the, the main goal is to uh, to have a, a, an absolutely diverse group where we can exchange uh, ideas, have thought-provoking discussions on our practices so we can eventually reveal the whole thing. So yeah, so haven't thought about that. Yeah. Okay. Isabel, your comments, please. Well, I think I... we are about to, to come to another fantastic Saturday afternoon. Yes. <laughs> I think I've said everything that um, I had in mind. I'm very excited. Uh, Brass Tiesel has always has given me so much. And I think this is a small way I can give back. And I'm also very, very honored to be on the board. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Isabel, you, you do represent uh, uh, a member of the group who we have already discussed that. So Isabel has, uh, is at my age when I started into business English. And it's just amazing to, to only today we, we had uh, professionals from completely different uh, moments uh, presenting uh, at the board and presenting at our BSIG uh, as well. And we can all learn uh, from each other. So, uh, before coming to an end of our whole presentation, we still have more two slides. Of course, consider taking a screenshot of this uh, page so you can uh, uh, simply not forget our channels and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn as well. Stay tuned for more because we are about, uh, I, I, as I told you before, we are going to launch the, the group where we can have a community supporting each other. Uh, also, uh, this event would not simply be possible without uh, the support of the Brass Tissot. This is the very last event of a whole series of events that has happened along the month of October, which is here represented as the Teacher's Month and presented by all the SIGs you see in this uh, screen. Uh, and also thank you very much for all the uh, uh, sponsors for this event, including the ones you can see in our sc screen right here. So thank you very much. And I thank you very much who is watching this session until now uh, for your time, your attention, your collaboration. And of course, we look forward to seeing and meeting you uh, in further opportunities uh, for years to come. So stay tuned for the Brass Tissot Business English Special Interest Group so we can learn together a lot more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. It was amazing. Thank you for staying with us. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, can we, uh, is it possible to, how can I possibly return to the screen? Yes, you, you've done it. Yeah, are we here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Is it possible to take a screenshot? Can we? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's take Please. a picture. Very good. Smile. <laughs> Very good. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Uh, and stay tuned for more uh, in upcoming Rusty Soul Business English teaching events. Have a nice end of Saturday uh, and we see you around. Bye bye. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.